Yes, 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 yes. Bless up, bless up everyone. Bless up. Um, greetings and welcome, welcome to Reason with Ratigan. I'm looking at the chat room, it's lively already. Uh, again, yes, family, good afternoon and welcome to Reason with Ratigan with your host and family member, Will the Rebel Ratigan on Reggae Global Radio, Facebook and uh, YouTube. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and don't forget, to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Um, and of course, it doesn't cost you anything. So please. Last week, I spent some time to explain the law that allows you to get information from the Jamaican government regarding its activities. And that law is the Access to Information Act of 2002. And if you really care about Jamaica and government activity, Please do not allow this information to go to waste. You have to use it. I mean, it was created for you. So it makes no sense for you to just have it sit there and don't take advantage of it. And then complain that you don't know what the government is doing. As I said to you last week, they don't have to tell you everything because there are nine exceptions. But you'd be surprised at how much information you can get regarding our government and the way they're doing things. Um, so again, use it. And if you run into problems accessing the site or stating the issue, because you have to, um, you have to state in one of the boxes, what is it exactly you're asking for? And if you run into issues, uh, please do not hesitate. Contact me. Um, what I would suggest is you go back to the JAMP website and just take a look, uh, just a dry run, just to go through and if you have any issues, then again, please feel free to call me. Today we have one guest, and one guest only, Rosalia Hamilton. And this young lady is no stranger to this program as she has made several appearances. And you family have always asked for her return. And so she's back here today. She'll be here today to discuss some recent happenings in what I call content rich Jamaica. I mean, there's always something going on. Always, always, always. I mean, when when I was told before that, because I was a little bit concerned when I started the program that I wouldn't have enough content and um, a very influential person in Jamaica told me, you won't have any issues because in fact, the issue, the issue you said you're going to have is 
how you choose the content. Which ones do you highlight? Because there's so many. Um, there's so many of them, and they're coming out on a daily basis. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Rosalia's um, activities, she's a well-known personality, not only in Jamaica, but on the uh, African continent. Um, she's also the honorary um, uh, consul for Sierra Leone to Jamaica. Um, her CV is very extensive, but she's a very modest woman, and she would not she would not want me to spend a great deal of time talking about her achievements. Uh, however, let me say that she's a very, very serious social activist, an entrepreneur, chairman of the Lasco Foundation, university professor, and, um, and one of the leading voices in Advocates Network, a forceful civil society group. Uh, let me just, I should have done this before. Please bear with me. Let me just turn the, uh, the phone. Um, to, 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 uh, here we go. Sound. Okay. So again, Rosalia Hamilton will be here with us today. And I also hope to have Herb Nelson, a fan favorite, uh, as well. Please join us, um, to, uh, discuss the issues. Join us for the conversation via telephone or the chat rooms on the Reggae Global radio platform or my YouTube channel, Reason with Radigan. And as a reminder, the telephone number is, I can't commit it to heart. I still have to look. It's 667-369-8569. Again, the number is 667-369-8569. One more time, 667-369-8569. Plus, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, the phone number, the, the line is open or will be open from 4.30 to uh, 4.50 New York time. And that's 3.30 to 3.50 Jamaica time and 9.30 to 9.50 UK time. And a second opening period will be from 5.30 to 5.50 New York time, 4.30 to 4.50 Jamaica time and 10.30 to 10.50 UK time. Now, let me just say this, that if you call um, outside those periods, I will not be able to take your phone call. And that's just because... Uh, we have to be mindful of the issues and we don't we don't want to interrupt the flow. So that's why we have those two periods. And if we go longer than three hours, which I doubt we will today, but if we have to, then, you know, you can call in at any time thereafter. As a reminder, oh, Catherine, I'm sorry about that. I didn't, the, the um, my notification didn't go out today. We'll talk about that some other time, but uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, as a reminder, please don't forget to tune into Reggae Global Radio tonight at midnight until 2 a.m. and relax with the rebel. Tonight I plan to do something a little bit different, and I think you're going to love it. I want to fuse soft rock with R&B. doesn't sound like a good uh, marriage, but trust me, um, you're going to recognize most of the songs, and I'm positive that you'll find yourself singing along with the music even dancing, who knows. Uh, so make your plans and join me at midnight tonight on Reggae Global Radio. Shout out time. Bless up everybody. Praise and blessing for my Eileen. Mama Eileen, Papa Trevor. Ma P and the family, big up yourself. I saw you yesterday, looking good. Uh, Ma Jean, Bonnie Jump, Sassy Diva, Bob, Reg, and of course, Mrs. Nelson, um, Herb Nelson's wife. As always, big shout out to all of you. Again, my family, by blood, relations, and choice. You know, this is some of your best, some of your best friends are not your family members. You know, um, they're your brethren or your brothers, but these are people that you've chosen to be a part, to become a part of your life. So all of you out there, bless up. Big up again to the Reggae Global family, the Meadowbrook crew, the Firehouse crew, the Rollington crew, Donovan and the Admirals, the saw, don't move a muscle, and the crew of hardworking Jamaicans, including JCF and JDF members, maids, laborers, 
and the people struggling to make ends meet. And in Jamaica, that's a significant number of you. God willing, the suffering will come to an end. It may seem long, but it won't be forever. And I say that, I use that phrase because back in the 1990s, early 1990s to mid 1990s, I was involved in, a, in an FBI drug gang investigation in Florida. And the JCF provided invaluable assistance in the form of a senior officer who was seconded to us to help with trial preparation. And as we prepared for trial, I had some challenges with the prosecutor. A young prosecutor, she was, she was somewhat experienced, but she was very nervous about the case and she wanted to make a good show of it. Um, I, I don't blame her, but we were constantly, you know, battling over some minor things. Um, and at one point, she and I got into a, a little argument and the JCF officer took me aside and he said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's pretty close to what he said. He said, Rattigan, I know it's difficult, but just do what she wants you to do because it may seem long, but it won't be forever. And that's my advice to all of us, particularly the sufferers. It may seem long, but it won't be forever. Keep that in mind. Update on the uh, One Jamaica Legal Defense Foundation. We're still waiting to hear from the IRS regarding the tax-exempt status. Uh, the wait may seem long, but it won't be forever. That's applicable there, too. Um, it's, uh, I've been told that these things, they could take uh, several weeks, even months. Um, we've submitted, we submitted it about maybe three weeks ago or so. Uh, yeah, Torian, it may seem long, but it won't be forever. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll just keep waiting, but it's, it's going to happen. Michelle, big up yourself, firehouse crew. It's going to happen, going to happen, going to happen. And then when it does, you guys are going to be pleasantly surprised about the impact or concerning the impact we're going to make in Jamaica. And as I've said many times, it's to hold the government accountable. This government and every government coming after this government. But we're going to start with this government and every government. We don't care about party or politics. We care about policies and we care about people and we care about performance. Speaking of performance, we, we're going to go through some job description for ministers of government today. But I'll leave that to... Uh, to uh, Rosalia. Other news. Huh. This one, I want to take the key, you know. For a long time, long, long time, the Police Federation has been complaining about prisoners being remanded to the JCF instead of correctional services. Let me repeat. For a long, and, and I'm repeating not because I made a mistake. I'm repeating because I just want this to sink in. For a long time, the Police Federation has been complaining about prisoners being remanded to the JCF instead of correctional services. What that means is that somebody goes to before the court and the court says, okay, you're remanded. That person is usually in the custody of the JCF. But if you think about it, that person should be in the custody of correctional services. We have too much things that go on. We need, we need the police on the street. Actually, most of them we need on the street, trying to deal with the crime issue. We don't need them to sit down behind um, desks and talk about them on policy wonks and all this nonsense. We don't, need, we don't need that. We know what issues are in Jamaica regarding crime. We know, but we just need to start doing something about it. So when a judge remands someone, that person is turned over to the police. And then what happens? They're put in a lockup. And so they're responsible for the person. But in truth and in fact, and the way it's done in many, 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 many countries, including countries that we take cues from, correctional services. 
and so that the police they're freed up to go about and do whatever they need to do to deal with crime. This has been a constant problem in Jamaica, and I'm going to highlight it today on this platform. Now, on several occasions, including the 80th, 80th Police Federation Conference that was held on May 30th of this year, the chairman of that organization, Corporal Rohan James, complained about the issues associated with having police personnel perform this duty. And he's been pleading with the Minister of National Security, and he's been pleading with the police commissioner to address the issue. And the issue has not been addressed. And over the past year or so, prisoners, including prisoners arrested for serious, serious violent crimes, have escaped. Marjorie, pick up yourself. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be there last night. Had to uh, take care of some things out of town, but I'll be there next week. But as I was saying, prisoners have escaped. Last year or so, they've escaped from police facilities located in Withhorn, Westmoreland, St. Catherine South, Ocho Rios. Huntsby, Linstead, and the, the, the latest jailbreak occurred in Black River, where eight prisoners escaped. Now, you see the pattern and the trend here. Six, six jailbreaks over the last year or so. And the Police Federation chairman, he's been petitioning, pleading with the Minister of National Security and the police commissioner to do something about the problem. He's brought this issue to their attention many, many, many times. See, when the courts in Jamaica, when they remand prisoners, they, they should be sent to the Horizon or the Tamarind Farm remand centers, and they should be handled by the correctional services. Now, they're doing that, but they're doing something else as well. They're sending them to the police. They should not be in police lockups because of obvious reasons. Some of them I just mentioned. Plus, some of these facilities that they're sending these prisoners to, they have outlived their usefulness, meaning them no good, no good no more. Them, the, the original purpose for that facility is not relevant to today's, the issue affecting prisoners and, and the issue about being remanded. Just can't deal with it. Some of them should be closed, I'm being told. Some of them should be closed immediately because of staffing issues and the deplorable conditions that exist at these facilities. Now, the government has been talking about building centralized remand centers, but for now, like a lot of their plans, it's just pure talk, it's lip service. These facilities should be made, well, they said they are a priority. And although they are considered a priority, they're not addressed in a timely manner, and they should be fast-tracked. Now, let me... On the new marriage, is a document, man. I mean, I really like the rumor thing, and, you know, John said this, and Harry said that, and Mary... No, we like, reach for the documents, then. All right? No, they have something called the Consensus on Crime, which they came out with in 2000, just before the election. And they have something called a Crime Consensus Monitoring and Oversight Committee. Long name, big name. Essentially what it is, it's just an oversight board. And they come up with, with dates and the plans to make sure that things are done when them send them out to do that. Right? Now, here are some of the things that they said about the correctional services. This is back in 2020. They said priorities. 
establishment of a review team to present standards for Jamaica's correctional services facilities and human capacity requirements for 2020 and beyond. And the target date to do all of that was March of 2021. And then they revised it. They couldn't complete it in March 2021. They moved it to August of 2021. And then they had an update. And the update was presentation conducted in September, identifying gaps and challenges and outlining improvement plans, detailed work plan with targets and owners to be provided. This is back in 2021. Here's another one. Development of a costed and phased plan for review of physical improvement and or replacement of all prisons and lockups with particular attention to Tower Street against standards to be developed. The target date was June of 2021. That was revised the date to September 2021. And the update is while standards and needs assessments, needs assessment is virtually complete, design and costing will require a few more months to be finalized, aim to complete submission for 2022 budget. Most of that didn't happen. And then we have one here, another one here. Enhancing our correctional services department with more emphasis on rehabilitation, health, education, and personal development of offenders. Now, you know, say, a copy them, copy this. Copy them, copy this from some country. And I think most of us know where them copy, the country that them copy this from, right? Because all this stuff here, none of this, none of this is really being done. You might have it done like in a perfunctory way and also in a minuscule way, but done comprehensively the way that they said that they're going to make it a priority. No. Um, here are some of the things. Expand probationary and support systems to help the reintegration of released offenders. Meaning that when you go to prison, you know, and 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 you you do your time and you come out, they might have a support system to help you to help reintegrate you into society. We don't see that. That now expand range. <clears throat> excuse me, of community service options. Oh, by the way, that was supposed to be done in uh, by June of 2021. No such thing. Um, expand range of community services option. That was supposed to be done of June 2021. Here's another one: moving traumatized juveniles, those with with learning disabilities and mentally ill out of the prison system and into more appropriate facilities. That should have been done by September of 2021. Establish a review team to present standards for Jamaica's correctional services. We talked about that. That should have been done by December 2020. And then the plan to improve the lockups, um, including Tower Street, GP. That was supposed to have been done by March of 2021. None of them things that most of them not happen. Dorothy, Antim Kanga, big up on herself. Fall on her, big up on herself. None of the things that I just talked about with the with the, the correctional services. No, it never happened. Here's something else. The Black River Jail, the most recent one, right, is typical of the problem faced by the JCF. So, you know, look, I try to be fair, balanced, and objective. If something is wrong, I don't care, or if somebody does something wrong, I don't care who the person is, you call out the person, right? And you hope that the person will admit or if the person has a, if the, or if the person has a, uh, as an explanation, or if the person takes exception, because maybe me wrong, then can explain to me and say, no, you're wrong, because here's what, here's what, here's what happened. I'm open to that. But we can't keep blaming the police for every single thing that happens in Jamaica as far as crime is concerned. When I said the police, I'm talking about the people doing the heavy lifting, the people doing the patrolling, the people arresting people, the people testifying. I'm not talking about the administrators and because as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of them, they're empty suits. Oh, them don't wear suits, sorry. They wear uniforms, empty uniforms. 
right? They have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. But let me tell you this, that the JCF is composed of some outstanding investigators, some in outstanding administrators. But they're not promoted, they're not put in a position to provide the necessary assistance to the management, the top level management, they're not there. I know quite a few of them. And I would go to war with these folks any day of the week and twice on Sundays. So when we talk about the JCF, sometimes we just have to be careful that we're not taking you know, a few bad apples and then tarnishing the entire organization. Like some people say, oh yeah, the JCF, you know, full of corruption. Yes, there is corruption. And a great deal of corruption. But we shouldn't walk away with the idea that every single policeman, every single policeman, policewoman is corrupt. We shouldn't do that. We should identify the ones that are corrupt. We should name and shame them. We should also identify and name and shame the ones who are responsible for the corruption. Because they allow it to happen and they haven't put mechanisms in place to arrest the spread of corruption. But, but, and again, I'm not making a pitch for the police. I'm just saying that in fairness, we have to be honest. And we have to give them their just due. And whenever they're wrong, then we say, okay, you know, this police station or a few members here or whatever, we call them out. Serena, so I agree with you 100%. JCF is top heavy. I've been saying that for years. But getting back to the story, at the Black, the Black River jailbreak, there was one, one dege dege constable assigned to guard 48 prisoners. One. One, one, one dege dege constable. And it escaped. Now, here's what the, here's what the JDF did, the JCF did. They interdicted the constable and his sergeant. And I found out today, because interdict, it, it has several meanings, but I found out that in Jamaica, when you say interdict, it basically means that they're removed from duty with, and they give them three quarters of their pay. Now, I've also heard that the police were in on this jailbreak I can't say yay or nay. All I can tell you is that what is factual is that eight people, one person was responsible for watching 48 people. Eight of the 48 escaped. And that the, the watchman and his boss, the constable and the sergeant, they were relieved of their duties and given three quarters, three, three quarter pay. Now, here's the injustice of it. The senior officers responsible for the facility were transferred with full pay. Now you kind of get a sense as to why the corruption is just, you know, and again, I say this in a guarded fashion because I don't know the and I don't I don't know the full story, but from what I know. Two people were relieved of their duties with three-quarter pay. The rest of them, the high-ranking people, they were transferred with full pay. Now, if I were in charge of the JCF, the constable would have to answer. The sergeant would have to answer. But the people them who run the institution, the people them, the, you know, the big, big people them, they have to report. They have to, they have to be held accountable. In fact, I would make a, an object lesson out of them. I'd make an example out of them. Considering the fact that we've had like six jailbreaks in a short period of time. And that's only six that I know of. I mean, maybe some of you family members, maybe you know about more than six. 
But that's what I would do. And the question is, why is the Ministry of National Security and the police commission, commissioner dragging their feet at the recommendation made by the chairman of the police federation? The man I tell them this from a long time. And them spend most of them time, I try to besmirch this man's reputation. I try to demean this man. I try to undermine him instead of listening to him. He's been telling them this for a long time. And, and it's like it's just falling on deaf ears. People just not care. No care in the world. So that's something that we, we should pay attention to, the jailbreaks. And I don't know how many of us are actually doing that, but that's an issue. Oh, here's another issue that we should pay <laughs> close attention to. A couple of days ago, the RFK, I think that's the name of this exclusive resort on the North Coast, was held up. And and the, the Lion, you're right, not jailbreaks, uh, they're bought out of jail. But even if that's the case, we need to hold the, 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 the people in charge of the institution responsible. If the idea is that you're just going to hold a constable, you know, even if he's in on it, There's a big up yourself. Even if, if, if he's in on it, we still have to hold the other people. We can't just hold him responsible. No. And by the way, why do we have so many jailbreaks? Why? Somebody, are they, are they, somebody, 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 um, the, 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 the so-called managers, they don't see this happening? They them not, them not, they don't understand that, okay, we have to, we have far too many jailbreaks. We need to do something about this. Yeah, money run. So, I mean, so that the, you're right. Because, to, I mean, I can't believe that the, the Jamaican prisoners, I mean, they're that astute, they're that competent at breaking out of jails. They have help. We know that. But the question is, what are we doing about it? And then, see, what the, what the chairman has said, he said, don't put them in police custody. Remind them to correctional services. Let them deal with it. That's their job. They're in the prison industry. We're in the protection business, safety, security, reassurance. That's our business. So, and then we're hearing all kinds of stories about you know, people, you know, uh, they're, they're so-called breaking out of prison and they're breaking out of prison uh, to commit certain things, certain acts. But again, I don't want to go into that because then we start venturing to the hearsay business and I, I'm trying to stay away from it. At times, you, you, you know, you have to talk about it because as we say in Jamaica, if it not goes so, it nearly goes so. But sometimes you have to be careful um, because... That same phrase also means if it not go so, then it not nearly go so. And so you just have to be careful. Yeah, uh, sometimes you make informed guesses based on the facts. You know, but you, you, you guess because your facts will take you to a certain point, and then you have to make that leap beyond that point. How you do it? is a challenge so but this fancy hotel on the north coast oh i see my guest is here hold on one second rosalie i'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you on bear with me the, the, this fancy hotel on the north coast um it was robbed by gunmen they stuck up the uh the workers and 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 guests and we don't hear much about it. But here's what we've heard from the police commissioner. He's going to, he's calling for a high level investigation. Yeah, FDR hotel, high level investigation. No, that is what you call a soft target in police terms. 
meaning that you have to pay close attention to, you know, if you're worried about criminal activity, that's one area that you, you, you should, especially given the importance that tourism plays in the economy of Jamaica. But they went and they held it up and we, oh, oh, we hear, oh, they're going to have a high level investigation. No. Warm to the people in Jamaica where are dead like flies at the time. How oh, we know you're not about high level investigation for them? We don't hear about film investigation. We hear about tourism investigation. And keep in mind that, you know, them, them selling this, this bill of lies saying that, oh, tourism is propping, propping up Jamaica. Tourism bringing like estimated like 2. I don't know, 2.8 million US dollars. But guess what? A lot of it is not in Jamaica. Because when me buy a ticket for Jamaica, most of that money, Jamaica will never see it. Because you go to a service overseas, outside the country. Most of the money you see coming in for tourism in Jamaica is coming in to pay the menial workers. And it's coming in to pay bills. It's not coming in as investment. It's not coming in to develop ecotourism, community tourism, so that the poor people can benefit from, the tour from, from, from tourism. No. Most of that is, you know, them have the all-inclusive. So they really don't have much to do with it. And a lot of it, a lot of the things that they use, imported. Keep that in mind. But now we have a high-level investigation that's going to start, or probably started already. Um, and you know how that story, that, that they're trying to clamp it down. Ed Bartlett, Minister Ed Bartlett, I know you have an issue now. You have an issue now because, you know, PR is, it, 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 especially in social media terms, it's like wildfire that spread. And now them, them go all up the what? Them go all up, well, I don't mean, know if them white are black, but them go all up the tourists then. So you know that I was spread now. Say, hey, Jamaica is even for gangsters and crooks and whatnot, and them just hold up a whole bunch of tourists. So we're going to have a problem there. We're going to have a problem. But even, even acknowledging that problem, I still have a huge problem with, with, with the fact that we don't have high level investigations for our own Jamaicans that are being shot and killed and maimed and stabbed in the streets, in their homes, at work, wherever, on a daily basis. We don't hear about that. So you have to ask yourself, Jamaica, is this the kind of police leadership we're looking for? That they care more about the tourists? And remember, no, no, not a single tourist, based on the reporting, not a single tourist was physically harmed. That's what we're hearing. Them stick up the place, take all the money. It's traumatic because you spend money for go have a good time. You don't spend money for go someplace and get and get you know held up. No. But we cannot forget that we have our own people that we have to take care of. And we're just dropping the ball. Dropping the ball. People, are, they just, they, they, they're dying and it's like, okay, yeah, that's another one. It's just a statistic and then we'll move on. But tourists, no, that's a different story. We have to protect the tourism industry. We have to protect tourists. Anyway, I have Herb Nelson here and I have Rosalie here. And so I don't want to hold them up, but I just want to say one more thing before I bring them on. Actually, two more things. Bear with me, Rosalie and, and Herb. Um, Herb Nelson is uh, he's he has a secure security portfolio for uh, a group in Washington called the Caribbean Institute. Um, I know I'm saying that wrong. It's not. It's 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 uh, where is it? It's it, it's it's Caribbean Institute. Herb, and you know what? Let me bring on Herb and let me bring them on right. Okay, that's Rosalia. And where's Herb? I don't see Herb. Okay, there he is. Herb, it's a Caribbean Institute. Right. What was it? Uh, Car In Institute of Caribbean Studies. Institute of Caribbean Studies. Yeah, I All see right. It. Yes. All right. No, they have a. They have a. Uh, they, they, it's a. It's a nonprofit organization, and I think it's sponsored in some part by the U.S. government. But they're very, very influential in Washington, and they deal with Caribbean issues. Now, every year they have something called Legislative Week, where over in Congress, they have uh, uh, it, it, they have conferences, they have talks, they have forums, and what they do is they invite the the legislators, the senators, and the Congress men and women, people who are actually funding their efforts, to come and either participate as as, as guests. 
as guests or panelists. No, I I have been fortunate that Herb, I don't know, Herb Simur and Amida me seen myself, but Herb had me on a few years ago as a panelist, and then all of a sudden now I'm 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 a moderator for some for for for, for at least one um one of these meetings. But this year it's a little bit different. Herb had me down for three. So I had to go. There's one on Zoom on Tuesday. There's uh, I had to drive down to Washington on Wednesday and I had to drive again on Thursday. But it was well worth it because some of the topics that they discussed, I mean, they directly impact the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica. And I'll tell you, the, on Tuesday, they were talking about um, the forum was Justice Matters. That, that was the, the, the name of the forum. Then on Wednesday, it was uh, political instability and good governance, resolving key issues in the Caribbean. And uh, that went over well, because Jamaica came up quite, quite often in that discussion. In fact, the prime minister's name got mentioned in there. And I don't think it was mentioned in a complimentary way. And the... This, no, sorry. The second day, it was crime and security, resolving key issues in the Caribbean. And then on Thursday, it was political instability and good governance, resolving key issues in the Caribbean. And I could go over it and talk to you more about some of the things that came out of those meetings, at least the meetings that I chaired. And I saw quite a few legislators uh, tur uh, who turned up for the, um, for, the, for the talks. And some of the things they had to say, uh, I'm telling you, um if i were jamaica i would be i would be very very concerned about some of the things that the people who would be making decisions about funding about funding some of the issues and some of the the, the, the initiatives in jamaica what their thought process is about what's going on in fact i asked them a question i said because some of them we had a, the last day we had a panel of six people uh, um, State Department, we had one person from, two people from State Department, one from INL, another person from INL, and they were all talking about monies that they're spending in Jamaica. And then I asked them one simple question. There was one guy on the panel who, he didn't talk about, he didn't talk about resolving the issues. He talked about the issues. Most of them talked about what they were doing to resolve the issues. He said, no, I'm going to focus on just the issues. And I asked them one question. Considering the amount of money that's being spent in the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, are we winning? And the answer was, to be frank, it was a resounding no. The answer was, we're making some incremental gains, but in terms of winning the strategy in Jamaica, crime, corruption, no. No. But I'll, I'll leave that for another time. Last thing I want to talk about is this. And you're going to find this interesting, family members. The ambassador, the Jamaican, Jamaican ambassador to the U.S., she had a, a town hall. She has a town hall meeting called Let's Connect. And every few months or so, she'll, she'll bring on guests, uh, mostly ministers from Jamaica, and they'll get a chance to interact with the diaspora. And so she had one two nights ago. And the guests were Minister Nigel Clark and Minister Kamina Johnson Smith. Minister Kamina Johnson Smith was there in person in Washington, D.C., because she showed up. It's Caribbean American Week, so they had all kinds of functions and meetings and this and that. You know the diplomatic world around. And but uh, Minister Nigel Clark joined joined us uh, via Zoom, and we had approximately 250 people. Um, 250 people uh by zoom and about 10 people in person at the embassy no let me tell you what no, no. <laughs> i think her verb did i watch it too they came on both of them and if you didn't know anything about jamaica if you didn't know anything and you listened to the presentation made by those two ministers i was gonna use an adjective but just by those two ministers if you listen to them you would think that Jamaica had very little crime problem because the Minister Kamina Johnson Smith talked about the gains that they were making. So you think that they had little crime problem. You would think that the economy was in outstanding shape, right? The minister actually brought his charts and went through the charts 
and dazzled us with all kinds of things like you know like a magic a magician would uh, uh, you would think that the standard of living in jamaica is 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 is, is okay that people aren't suffering you think that we almost have like full employment i mean if you listen to everything that they said jamaica is a they painted a rosy picture i'm not saying that good things aren't being done in jamaica don't get me wrong but most of the things they talked about no no they obscured the facts right and again i'm i give credit where credit is due i can point to things that both of them have done that i can say yeah i can see where this makes sense and where it's helping jamaica but i can also point to things that they've done or they haven't done that resulted in the detriment to jamaica and the jamaican people and people in the diaspora so minister kamina johnson smith she was asked she was asked two questions by our learned friend mr jeffrey tavares actually she was asked one and the minister and minister clark was asked another one minister clark was asked what about the ssl investigation and the fbi because he told us in the initial stages when the story broke that the fbi was there or would be coming and they would be doing this and they'd be doing that and blah 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 and we haven't heard anything and then he asked minister kamina johnson smith about her failure to file regarding the gift she received and whether or not it was a gift and he asked her and she turned pale she turned pale minister nigel clark his demeanor just completely changed when he got the question and he tried to answer it but sometimes you cannot defend the indefensible Sometimes you just don't have an answer to the, not every question can be answered. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I don't know the answer. I made a mistake when I told you this, but politicians, I find by nature, they find that idea repulsive. They find it repugnant that they can make a mistake and admit to making a mistake. That's very difficult for them. And we saw an example of it two nights ago. Two nights ago and then uh, uh, uh one of the uh in the chat room there was somebody who who let out uh, something that most people didn't even most people weren't even aware of something having to do with one of uh the ministers minister kamina johnson smith's uh family members but you know i try to stay away from family members because i just try to hit them with the issues and then we go from there if the family members are involved in the issue, then that's a different story. But she got hit with, 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 with that issue regarding a family member. And the question was asked five times and she couldn't answer. It was embarrassing. And, and if you looked at the chat room, I mean, this diaspora, we don't know where we come from. We don't know where we come from because we took them to task. I mean, everything that they put up, people were just shooting them down, left, right, and center. This diaspora is different from the diaspora of 20, 30 years ago. This diaspora is very active, very resilient, very knowledgeable, and, and, and to some degree, very aggressive. And when I say aggressive, I mean aggressive in a good way, that you're not going to let the issues go. So anyway, we have a two guests, and we don't, well, actually, Herb is here with me every week, and we have Rosalia, who's um, took time out of her busy schedule to come talk to us about some pressing matters. And I'd like to talk to her about um, the the protests and a whole bunch of things. But I tell you what, what we'll do is we let our family member take the floor and just talk to us in the way that she knows best, that we understand. Um, so, and, I'm, and by the way, she can't talk like, like them uppity people that do, you know, but, you know, when she demongs we, you know, she talks so that we can understand. But I don't want her to get it wrong, you know, the PhD, but she have you know, buy, she buy, bite, you know, she work hard for that one day. So she can't talk the language. But what we, one of the things that we really admire about it is that when she, she's such a humble woman, that when she come amongst our people, she talk to us in ways that we can understand. You know, she not talk to us like some ministers, you know, them talk, well, all right, like some ministers, we leave it at that. So without further ado, Rosalie, welcome to the program. Welcome home. Welcome to your family. The floor is yours, ma'am. Talk to us. And by the way, her big up yourself and, and, and your family. Greetings to you, Doc. Uh, greetings, uh, uh, 
Attorney Rattigan, and thanks for your support this week at the ICS. Uh, they love it down there. And maybe we'll have uh, Prof. Melton share something next year. You know it. You should. You should. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for having me again. No free steak, how do? do? Well, all right, man. We're going. We're going. We're going. We're here yeah. where you have to talk about it, you know? <laughs> Well, you know, um, we continue to do the work of the Advocates Network. You know, it's so important that, you know, we hold our elected officials accountable. We see it as part of our civic responsibility as citizens of Jamaica. Um, the Advocates Network comprise individuals and organizations that are committed to improving good governance and human rights in Jamaica. And so over the last few weeks, I'm sure your listeners would have seen our social media posts, the um, lunchtime protests, and um, all our advocacy to really challenge and encourage the government to think again about the unacceptable, unconscionable salary increases. We did several press releases to this effect. We felt that in the context of the wage restraints that the unions were asked to hold in the context of their negotiations for higher wages and salaries. They were told that, you know, if they got any more, it would um, challenge and, 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 and um, limit the kind of economic reforms that were taking place. And so we were all shocked, quite frankly, at the idea that the political directorate could justify providing more than 200% increase in salaries when on average we were informed that the majority of the public sector workers got about 20%. And the justifications and explanations have been unacceptable. The idea that you attract good people with high salaries misses the point of public service the very thing ministers have been saying to nurses and teachers and police officers that, you know, they must go beyond the call of duty um, to serve. And even if we accept the idea that somehow salaries is what will attract good quality people as opposed to commitment to serve, it begs the question, is this a full-time salary or a part-time salary? Mm. Because the salaries were low, and we know that members of parliament continue to hold private pra practice. They continue to have their businesses and so on. So now that you have the significant increase, will they continue to do their businesses, etc.? Is this now a full-time or a part-time um, um, compensation? So there are several issues being raised. And so we had wrapped up a month of advocacy. We wanted to make sure that this is not a nine day wonder, right? Um, that somehow we would you know, make a lot of noise and then it would end. We have committed, as you know, um, Wilfred, that our slogan is winner ease up. <laughs> so winner ease up. And we will continue to put this issue on the burner. Now, I want to say to listeners that advocacy matters. And although we didn't get exactly what we want wanted, um, we certainly had seen some changes. We got a partial rollback. Um, the prime minister rolled back his salary and all the pensions that are associated with the prime minister's salary. We estimate that to be about 110 million Jamaican dollars that we saved taxpayers. So we see that as a partial victory. We also finally got tabled in the House of um, Parliament the, um, the job descriptions. Now, these job descriptions have been on the table for decades, and we've been hearing about them, and we've never seen them. So finally, there is a green paper that has been laid in Parliament and that green paper lays out the job descriptions for the members of parliament 
and we now have a ministry paper, paper 69, that is a job description for the ministers of government. And I just want to say something quickly on that one before we get into it, that the very first page or second page of that document says this document may be used as a tool to assess the specific performance of a minister of government. Now, our question is, well, if we have such a tool, why did we not make the assessment first before we give the increase? We've argued that we have the thing backwards, right? You put the cart before the horse because it is in the face of this assessment that we could justify those increases. We could say, yes, um, there are ministers who are working hard and they deserve the increase. And the absence of that assessment um, and the evaluation that would have been done for each minister, as is implied in this document that we've gotten a month later, right, after the salaries have been approved, we find that unacceptable. And uh, no doubt we can talk a little more about the details of that, but that is where we are. And the final point is that we now also have some headways on the code of con conduct. Now, that has been a very controversial issue. And let me put that in perspective for your audience, because there has been a code of conduct in Parliament all the way back in 2002, right? Um, the code of conduct for ministers was a ministry paper that was tabled um, number 19, ministry paper number 19 in 2002 under the PJ Passage administration. So it's been a long time we've been talking about this code of conduct. And what is important is that at the center, at the beginning of this document, we see the standards of public life, the seven principles of public life. These are also known as the Nolan principles. And these are the principles that have been used to guide uh, members of parliament in the UK and other parliaments across the world. And so these principles have been around for a long time. And the very same seven principles, the Integrity Commission had put in place in a two sets of training that they were asked to do by the government um, with respect to integrity issues, issues of corruption that was done both for cabinet ministers and um, shadow ministers. And these seven principles turn up again. This time, the Integrity Commission says, sign your on to these commitments of these principles. Sign on to them and make it clear that you support these principles. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, we see that only the opposition members have signed. We see that the cabinet ministers have not signed. Yet our prime minister said just this week in parliament that these are the same seven principles. He referred to the 2002 ministry paper that he expects not just the ministers, but the members of parliament to adhere to. And so if, you, if that is the expectation, it is very puzzling why the ministers are not asked to sign on them. Albeit it's seven principles, albeit that we need a more fulsome document that lays out other principles with, and, and activities with, with respect to a code of conduct, but at least you have a document already that you can review, finalize, and um, have a document in place. Unfortunately, we do not yet have a finalized version that we hope the ministers will sign, as well as members of parliament. But what we now have is a decision to take the code of Con conduct to a joint select committee for discussion. And my final point on that and on all of these issues is that one of the things that we have been fighting for and is a part of the constitutional reform process and discussion is mechanisms for the people to have a say in these decisions. So we have a joint select committee. We ought to have a mechanism in which we can ask questions, make suggestions, and comment 
on these documents. You're on mute. You're on mute. Um, let me just say to the folks listening on uh, Radio Global Radio that um, they're coming up on a commercial break, but we're going to go through the break. I mean, this this topic is so interesting and so important that um, you can join us on YouTube if you want, but uh, or if you want to stay with the radio station, that's fine. In fact, we'd rather you stay there because then you know the platform looks even um, it it looks even more involved when we have people listening from different on different platforms. So. Uh, we're going to take a break on the radio station, but um, you can rejoin us in about two or three minutes. Go ahead, Rosalie. Yes. So I was just laying out the context as what has happened and the work of our advocacy over the period. Where we are now is that our advocacy continues online. Um, we are now looking at the code of conduct, um, the job descriptions more carefully and we continue our um, advocacy to encourage Jamaicans at home and abroad because we see Jamaicans in the diaspora as part of the Jamaican family. And we know how important people in the diaspora are, not simply because of the financial contribution, but importantly because you're family and this is your home. And we in our Advocates Network have are actively engaged with the diaspora that members of the diaspora are part of the advocates network in fact at our highest level of decision making and so we um continue to have dialogue with our um our members in the diaspora and we continue to um, shape positions with respect to the constitutional reform process. As you know, this process is ongoing and it's very important that as many Jamaicans as possible um, make submissions to the Constitutional Reform Committee so that your voice can be heard and your positions can be heard with respect to this important um, set of decisions that must be made about a constitution that grounds the um, highest laws, not only in our parliament, but important, importantly, through our voice, with our um, perspectives, so that we can shape a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. All right, Rosalia, before I bring Herb in, let me just, let me just make this, this point. Um, and by the way, I have the, the, the two documents, the green paper and the white paper, and I've gone through them, but not with a fine, fine tooth comb, not yet, but I've seen I have I've seen some issues in them already. And you're right, the, the one about the um, holding people accountable, that's on page three of the um, 69. I think that's a green paper, right? 69? Uh, yeah, uh, 69 is a ministry paper. Right, is that the green one or the white one? Because The white four. one. The, the white, white paper. okay. And there's... In there, they, they mentioned something of something called the office of minister. Is that a new position or no? Which sorry, which one is that? On on uh, ministry paper number sixty nine. Oh, the green okay. paper is, is three. Yes, um, green paper is three. Yeah, the the the, the ministry paper number sixty nine on page mm -hmm. three. They have something called the office of minister. Is that is that a new? I've never heard of the office of minister. I, I don't know if it's something new. on page three. The office yeah. of minister. Yeah, it's page um, it on may, the third paragraph. It may mean the office of the minister. Um, oh, because it says office of minister. It sounds like yes. an official title for yes. uh, an agency. Yes, but, I read that to mean the office of oh, any minister. Oh, okay, so they, 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 they left out the, the yes. uh, definite article. It's not there. Yes. All right. So yeah, um, let me just make this one point and then I'll have her jumping because I know he's jumping at the bit. I can see him there looking at the screen. He, he wants to jump in right away. But let me just say this, that isn't it, isn't it interesting? Wait a minute. We lost her. Um, he'll probably come back. Isn't it interesting that a few weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago or so, the prime minister said in an interview or in a statement, he said, the reason why the government, and they were talking about the, the functionality or the dysfunctionality of the government. He's saying the reason why the, the, the government is, is the way it is is because the parliamentarians, they weren't being paid um, appropriately. 
And so that's why we have this kind of government. It's not, it's not, it's dysfunctional because we're not getting paid. But then a couple of days ago, I heard him say, and I heard it with my own ears, and I had to go back and listen to the thing again. It said that the government is working so well, so much so that we were able to give money to the public sector. And I said, well, wait a minute, hold on. Is the government working well or is it not working well? He's saying it's not working well because they're not being paid. But he said it's working well because we're paying the, 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 the public sector. And I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. Were you, are you aware yeah, of those it, it, it is confusing because the very premise that you don't get the best people because the wages, uh, the salaries are low, begs the question, do we have the best people in power now? Right. <laughs> Right. right. That's that's the first question because um, clearly the salaries have not been good, um, but they're there, and so it, you know, it, it is it now that we have to clean slate because you know the assumption is that they weren't you didn't get the best people, and so now we can find the best people. Um, and the idea, I mean, there have been studies that have examined this thing, and and there are studies that see that there is no. Um, causality, no, no, it's no clear relationship between the idea that salaries, in fact, attract better people. In fact, what they found is that the high salaries kept people in office longer. <laughs> Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and of course, it, these are studies done in other jurisdictions. It's not in our society. We don't know. And we're just guessing. We're guessing as to whether the, the salaries. Now, what is discouraging about this is that, that the focus is on the salary as opposed to the morality of the issue. And I raise that because the prime minister himself argued that the reason he decided to um, roll back his own salary and accept the previous salary is because he felt that as prime minister and as a political leader, it is incumbent on him to have high moral standards, high moral duty is how he, he phrased it. And it is that high moral duty to be cognizant of and be aware of the citizens and their concerns and so on and the sufferings that they are going through, that was the reason he rolled back his salary. And mm -hmm. I found that amazing because it spoke to his, it's, it, in my mind, it spoke to his own incapacity to influence his colleagues. Because I agree with the prime minister. That's a good reason not to accept it. And I'm not suggesting he may think it's acceptable to roll it back to the original salary. I think, given the position and um, areas of responsibility that the ministers and the MPs hold in our society, they ought to be paid more than what they're being paid. Albeit that the country is in a difficult situation, and we can talk about some of the reasons, but all the reasons, all the problems of the society cannot be put at the feet of ministers of government only. So therefore, I, I suggest that, yes, they deserve, and, and, they, and most Jamaicans agree that they deserve an increase. The salaries are low for those positions. However, the issue has been the scale of the increase. And no one can find good justification for the scale of that, those increases. So I think that's the issue on the table. And I, I just quickly, I want to clarify the point I made earlier, because I argue and there are others who do as well, that you a full understanding of where Jamaica is today is not simply about what the MPs and the ministers of governments do. It has a lot to do also with what the people of Jamaica have been prepared to accept and to tolerate and to be a part of. And I think that in a democracy where... It is the people who hire our representatives to represent us. We have to ask ourselves, have we been doing a good job? Have we been um, careful enough about getting involved in the process of choosing the right people? Um, and when the choice is made, for those of us who bother to vote, do we hold them accountable? Mm. 
um, we, I, I asked the JLP, the JLP people I know, I said, are you satisfied with the, minister, the decision of your government? And when the answer is no, I said, what are you doing about it? You should be leading the, com the country with respect to the advocacy for change because you did not vote your government um, um, to, to make these kinds of decisions. Right. So, mm -hmm. so, so that, that to me is about citizen activism. The role of the citizen in a democracy must be an active role. And I suggest that for the past 60 years, Jamaicans have not been active enough in holding our representative. And I think that is what has to change. I think that is no change. Um, I heard your earlier comments about role of the diaspora is not the diaspora that we had before and i think that um, that means we we're getting our feedback hold on one second maybe from right okay there we go Good. yeah and, and i and i think that 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 um that that activism that engagement once Jamaicans begin to actively engage, we will see a different Jamaica. It's mm. not about a handful of people in power. It's about the majority of us on our role. And last point I want to make on that point is this. We're now in the throes of contemplating what a Jamaican Republic will look like. And I'm very clear that we will have more of the same unless the Jamaican people become active, and make a very conscious decision that a republic must be a state in which the people of Jamaica are sovereign. And when the people of Jamaica are sovereign, the people of Jamaica will, will have to be actively engaged in the process of governance. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that we talk about the code of conduct. We talk, to, we talk about the statutory declaration, the integrity commission, constitutional reform. And we're being led, not ruled, because it's a democracy, we're being led by someone who cannot get his last two years of statutory declarations to be verified by the very institution that was, that was created to do this kind of work. And then we see where they're trying to take away the power from from, from that same institution, they're trying to make it powerless. So, and I say that to say this, we've always talked about how is it that, and I've seen it in the chat room as well, they said, how is it that some people, they go into politics almost penniless and after a few years, they're wealthy? Well, again, I wanna thank Herb for, for inviting me to, to the, the Institute's uh, program this week because I found a gentleman there who started giving me some advice very uh, learned gentleman when he, you know, international law. And he was telling me that there is such a thing as the, the kleptocracy something something act of the Congress where you can actually hold foreign government officials accountable in the US for the disappearance of funds or for the transfer of funds. So I'm gonna be meeting with him next week and we're gonna be talking about how we can collaborate and bring some of these men and women who have unexplained wealth um, attributed to them. How we can go up because I don't think that I don't think the Integrity Commission can do it alone. I think the diaspora has to step in, and we're going to step in because the last time I checked the Constitution, it says that I'm a Jamaican. Says that Herb is a Jamaican, even though we live here and even though we have dual citizenship, because Jamaica, the Jamaican government, uh, 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 acknowledges it and they accept it. I think, I think I think it's even written in the passport. Uh, but section three of the, of the Jamaican constitution says, if you were born in Jamaica, you're a Jamaican citizen. And if you were born before August 6, 1962, on that date, you became a Jamaican citizen. Unless, of course, you renounce. And to renounce, there's a whole process where you have to go through the consular, consulate, the, con, the, the consulate or the embassy, and then Minister of National Security, a whole. And we haven't done that. So the last time I checked, I'm still a Jamaican. Herb Nelson, please, sir, go ahead. Can I hear you? Well, 
We're not Herb. hearing. We're not hearing her. We're not hearing you. Let me call them. Okay, I see the problem. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, now we can hear. Yeah, I, I just didn't click on my mic. That's it. Okay. Yeah. I apologize for the uh, I had to transition from the computer to the laptop. But in any case, let me say this to you, uh, Will. The Kleptocracy Act expands whistleblower protection and provides substantial monetary rewards up to five million US dollars to whistleblowers who provide information on foreign government corruption mm. that leads to successful asset recovery. All right? Now, you've heard me talk about key time in the past. Mm -hmm. And key time simply is if there's a U.S. government project that's been funded and there is a lot of corruption involved, and you can show where the corruption is and help the U.S. government to recover the money from that corruption. You're entitled to like up to 30% of that money. Jamaicans, when I hear that, when so, I hear that, all I want to know about the, the teething and all them stuff there, Uncle Sam Money, if you can give us that information and there's a prosecution, you get 30% of the money. And in fact, I think, I think depending on how the level where you are, you might even be able to get, I'm not advertising that you will get it, but you might be able to get a visa to come and stay in America because your life will probably be threatened after that. Right, right. So they they will that. offer you protection too. Exactly. The, so the, the bottom line is this kleptocracy act, uh, whenever it was um, brought into being, I think it's back, uh, the, well, I won't say when, because I really can't pinpoint it at this point, but it's great because now, that you can show monies being misutilized or misappropriated, right? And this goes for uh, Jamaica Football Federation and every other organization, whether it's sports, whether it's um, uh, SDC or whether, whichever organization down there is recipient of U.S. funds, right? Um, I know that the the um, the the uh, the former ambassadors, uh, U.S. ambassadors to Jamaica, have another organization, Friends of Jamaica. That's considered U.S. funds, and if those funds are being abused, then that is should be subject to this um, act as well. Mm -hmm. So it's we do have weapons, people. That we can push back and we can fight back with and and i'm just tired of hearing people say there's nothing we can do and that it's just government no it's not just government and it's not just these organizations out there that misappropriate the funds and use it for all the wrong things <laughs> and then you sit back and say well it's just that's how it is that's how we are in jamaica no that's not how we are in jamaica you gotta change you got to grow up and you got to stand up and you got to make sure you put your foot down, right? Now, Dr. Dr. Uh, Rosalie. Okay, Rosalie, good. Uh, you know, um, myself and Mr. Radigan talk about this before. How is it that the good lady wanted to head up the Commonwealth? as the Commonwealth Secretary. And at the same time, she can't get the government to comply with the principles offered by the Integrity Commission. And though, according to the Integrity Commission, they are drawing on the principles of the Commonwealth to, to formulate their, their, their seven principles. So how is it that the government ministers, which would include her and her prime minister, can't comply with what Integrity Commission is asking them to do? What they're saying is, well, you know, I don't think we have the integrity to stand up to that. Hmm. The standards are too high. 
So if standards are too high, why don't they all resign? You know, um, it's 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 really very puzzling why, in fact, the the signatures are not done because it's not. It would. It, I could better understand it if there were other components that are debatable. But again, the prime minister told us this week that he expects that all members of parliament are guided by these principles. Now, if that is the expectation, then what's the difficulty in signing to it? I don't know. But for your audience, we should perhaps just talk a little about the principles because we're talking about things that all of us should live by, not just people in public life. Selflessness is number one. And I like to start there because that principle is the principle that is on, um, that we, is on the table right now with respect to the salary increases. The principle says that the holders of public office should take decisions solely, not mainly, solely in terms of the public interest. And that it's an offense to do so in order to gain financial or other material benefits for themselves and their families. Now, when you give yourself 200% increase in salaries and the salaries on average for the rest of the public sector is 20%. That sounds to me very selfish. And the decision is a financial gain to the political directorate and not to anyone else. And the statements that we've heard from the politicians that much of that money would be given away is it's really a slap in the face of Jamaicans who don't want handouts. Yes, they're Jamaicans who are part of the inner political process that thrive and live off the handout of politicians. Um, we know that. But the vast majority of Jamaicans, um, many of them who are not voting, um, most Jamaicans who are eligible to vote are not voting. I don't think you can make that assumption that people want handouts. And so... I am troubled by the idea that somehow you can justify it because you have to give away so much of your money. And I see nothing in the job descriptions, by the way, that speaks to the fact that um, the, the, it's a requirement to hand out money um, to all of this is about compassion. And many of us who have a fraction of the income that these politicians have are giving away money because we are empathetic to individuals who have lost family, get sick, um, house burned down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We do that as a normal course of life. So that's one thing. Integrity. Now, again, why would you not sign a code that speaks to integrity? Integrity, not to place themselves under any financial or other obligation outside of individual or organizations that might influence the performance of their duties. Now. That's what we're asking them to sign on to. And again, there is concern about why. Objectivity, ensuring that um, in the conduct of business, there are um, you know, awarding contracts, et cetera, et cetera, that these rewards are on merit and not um, subjected to um, any preferences. Accountability, now that's a big issue there. I want to come back to the accountability because one of the issues that is obfuscated in my mind in the job description is the actual process of holding uh, members of parliament, ministers of government, and the prime minister accountable to the people of Jamaica, right? So I'm going to come back to that. Openness, right? They should... Um, make sure that all the decisions are made as open as possible. That issue is also on the table now, um, Wilfred, because you know that the very document that was used to justify these salary increases, this is a document that was created by Ernst & Young, EY, the EY consultants, right? These, that document is a secret. The Gleaner under the Access to Information Act, has asked for a copy of that document and was told that it was incomplete. 
And that's the reason it's not being. I'll be right back. Now, yeah. we were all appalled at the idea that these unconscionable salary increases were agreed on by cabinet based on an incomplete document. That's simply unacceptable. And so the very principle of openness is being breached here in the context of a matter that is of high priority in terms of the public interest and the very um, justification and rationale for it embedded in a document is now kept secret. And so that is an issue. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't include it in my initial um, summary in terms of where we are and what we're doing. That, that is an issue of high priority for us in terms of our advocacy. We, we, we are demanding that that document um, is made public. And um, there are many other people, the Glean, of course, is pushing and others on that matter. The matter of honesty. Again, why would you not sign a document that says that you have a duty to, um, you know, be, um, ensure that any private in interest um, relating to public duties, you would take steps to avoid conflicts of interest, etc., and you would act in an honest way to protect the public's interest. Why would that be an issue? And the last principle is the principle of leadership. And here we hope that. Um, all of these principles would guide our political leaders and that they can lead by their actions and not a bag amount. Let me, let me ask you this in, in, in that sense. Mr. Ratigan filed this action against the good uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. But you would think that, going all the way back to Wheatley, I am the leader of the party. There's something happening in the ministry of science energy and technology and i have to take action something happens in the ministry of education where i was before with another minister i have to take action something is happening now in the ministry of foreign affairs which gives the entire country a black eye and i need to take action but as I understand it, he's never taken action against any of these ministers in the past. They have the one; they are the ones who have voluntarily uh, moved themselves out of uh, the the line of fire. So, where is the leadership? Who, who's in charge? Who's running? Who's minding the store? Who's running things? And, 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 if, and I, let me add, what are the mechanisms to hold the leaders accountable? Accountable, yes. Right? You know. and, and I think that's the conversation we're now having with respect to the constitution reform, because those accountability measures must turn up in the constitution, because that's the only way we can have a legal framework to compel mm -hmm. action. But you cannot have the executive sitting in the legislature steering the ship in the legislature and when there's corruption on their part the legislature is hamstrung i can't do anything about it and we have to deal with how to change that arrangement and it doesn't mean and i know a lot of people are looking at the american model and suggesting that we need to separate the chambers that's not the only answer that was the answer that the americans saw fit for them right. and given their own particular history and given the division between the federal government and local government and so on all of that makes sense for the americans and we know that there's still a challenge we've seen it right now with holding um your prime minister former president accountable, accountable. for actions right. right so my view is that there is no magic one is not necessarily better than the other they're just different ways of holding accountability in the parliamentary model what has to happen and has not been happening is the oversight of the not from the non-executive members of the legislature, they ought to provide effective oversight of the executive in parliament. And that is not what's happening. And if it works, what has happened in the UK can work in Jamaica 
and across the Caribbean. We've never seen anything like that. We've never seen members of their own party. These are the members of the legislature, MPs who are not part of the executive, forcing a prime minister to resign. And mm. do that when you have the mechanisms in place, the organizational framework in place, such that you can hold the executive accountable. And there are several things that has to happen. And we have to put these in our constitution. One, we need to ensure that the size of the executive does not dominate the legislature, right? And especially if the numbers are close. Remember, they, they wield a lot of power, right? And therefore, you want a small executive relative to the size of the legislature. And you want to give the legislature the tools and the power to act and act in a way that's not hamstrung, as you said, by the executive. And when you're able to do that, you can move a prime minister. Well, uh, last point on that, there ought to mm -hmm. be similar kinds of arrangements in the political party, such that the political party can also move the leader of the party when the legislators decide that um, there is a problem and his capacity to lead the nation is now being challenged because they, in their scrutiny and oversight, find problems that they cannot resolve. That was the story of Boris Johnson. Let me just say one last thing, Will. We have now had a minister of government who lost his visa and then he got it back. And at no point, at, well, there are several ministers who uh, did, did lose their visas. And there is no investigation by the legislature as the reason behind them losing the visas. So how can they be effective? How can they not be subject to graft and other pressures from outside? when they have this hammer or this question sign over their heads and, and therein lies the issue if we can't fix that we have a problem and the solution is not necessarily changing the entire structure and creating a new structure of the separation because that too has its issues has its limitations so i my own view is let us try to drill down and fix that no this is why I made a point earlier, and I'm going to repeat it, because the role of the citizen in holding your member of parliament accountable is paramount. Because that member of parliament may or may not be part of the cabinet. And if they're part of the cabinet, then there's that um, question of how the members provide the oversight through the House of Parliament of that um, member of parliament that's one thing but for the majority who are in um whether part of the opposition or part of the non-executive legislature their job is to ensure that the executive is doing the right thing and if you have these issues in fact i like to talk about this cabinet issue right now um this salary issue right now because it's very topical so what ought to happen is that there are investigations of this, this decision that the cabinet made that is of such controversy in the society. Now, why would an MP insist on that? Well, especially if it's the MP is, is benefiting, right? You now have to rely on the pressure coming from the people. The people ought to pressure the MP and say, MP, listen, we don't like this thing. You need to ask, you need to get a document, for example, that EY document that everybody wants to get. Your oversight responsibility means that you need to scrutinize it and you need to ensure that the justifications given in that document warrants this decision. And if you cannot do that, we have a problem with you because you're not doing your job. Mm. Let me just, just add a couple of things here. I mean, this this uh, chat room is very active and... Uh, 
some bright people inside that because I'm some of you might think I'm sleeping, but I'm actually taking notes from the chat room because there's some outstanding ideas um, being 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 provided through the chat room. Um, one of them, uh, Larry R mentioned that hey, we have I think Larry R said we have enough information and we need to send it to you, but we need for, you need to run an email or a, or a um, email or some other platform where we can send it info. Right now, hold on for the information because. The, we're waiting for the for the for the IRS to give us tax exempt status for the foundation because once we get the foundation, all of these uh, we'll have we'll have uh, ways where you can provide information in a in a sensitive manner so that it's not compromised because we don't want anybody to get hurt and we're not asking anybody to spy either. Let me just make that clear. I'm not asking people to provide information that will cause grave harm to the Jamaican government simply because they're in a position to do so. What we're talking about is where something, an act, an illegal act, a criminal act has occurred. And we say, okay, if you have information about that, then fine, give it to us because there is a reward out there and there could even possibly be a, a, a visa attached to that reward. Not promising you anything. It all depends on the information that you provide. But I know that Jamaicans, in, in particular those in Jamaica, you have information about what's going on with this corruption. And we're here to say, we, we, we want to start something. We want to address this issue. We don't only want to talk about it. Yeah, we talk about it, but we talk about it. We've been talking about it from time immemorial. As far back as I can remember, we say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. But, but now it's time for us to do something about it. And we're saying together we can collaborate, we can cooperate, and we can bring this issue under control. If you notice, I didn't say we can end this issue because corruption is very difficult to end. It's like crime. You know, even Singapore, with all the, you know, all, all the good things that they have done and the mechanisms they have in place, you still have some amount of, of crime being committed there. Not much, but you still have it because people are people, you know, and we're going to do things that we shouldn't do. We're not robots. Um, another thing is, uh, Lion said, don't be there upon them, but <laughs> true. Um, I also said that, you know, fire the amos must steal, fire the amos must steal. Him no a fire, or she no a fire, and a cold breeze no more. Them no say, we're not playing. The, this diaspora is not playing. And when we have people like Rosalia that can provide the information, can do all the stuff that she's doing to highlight the stuff, to educate the Jamaican public, it's a new day. And the government knows it. And like I've always said, it's not only for this government, it's for every, any government, any Jamaican government. We're going to go after them if they don't do uh, what they're supposed to do. Now, the concept, the, the, the Herb, you mentioned the Commonwealth principle. I find that to be an interesting argument because if the Honorable Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith, if she were successful and she got that job as Secretary General, the seven principles we're talking about, she would have to sign off on them or abide by them. Absolutely. So the question is, if you were applying for a job that you would have to abide by these principles, why can't you sign them in your own country? Absolutely. Why would you go sign them in England and say, okay, as a Secretary General, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show integrity, I'm gonna show objectivity, I'm gonna be accountable, I'm gonna be open, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna show leadership, I'm gonna uh, be selfless, right? Why is it that you can't do that in your country? But you're willing to go do it for the Commonwealth. It, it makes absolutely no sense. Then somebody's asking why was uh, the family member deported? <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, the kleptocracy thing that Herb mentioned, people, it's real. I actually spoke to somebody who's very familiar with that law. And he, like I said, he's willing to work with us to bring this corruption thing you know, to a halt. Not to completely end it, but to, to have people think twice now before they start dipping their, their, their hands in the cookie jar. Because right now, there is no thinking twice. They just do whatever they want to do. Right? Think about the amount of money that's actually been poured into Jamaica. And we cannot, we cannot point to the accomplishment of all of the projects that, that these monies came in for. Just think about it. The, the 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 COVID thing that alone was seven hundred and fifty million US dollars from three organizations, just from three organizations. And by the way, that was a loan. So some of, so, so some of us that you know the ones that are talking about oh you know it's much ado about nothing. All right, if you think so, when prices raise and you have to pay taxes, guess what? Some of your taxes when it's going to help you free. 
believe it or not, right? So you going to pay, you going to help pay back that loan, whether you believe it or not. And I have one thing to say to the naysayers. Whenever you, whenever, instead of, instead of criticizing us, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, instead of criticizing us, what you should do is ask yourself three questions. Is there corruption in Jamaica? Should we do something about it? And the most important question is ask yourself this, what are you doing about it? Ask yourself that question. And if you can answer those, if you, if you can honestly, objectively, intelligently, knowingly, responsibly answer those three questions, you will join this forum. You will join all of us trying to make Jamaica a safer, better, less corrupt place for all of us. Not just the, one, not just the people in Jamaica, but people abroad and our, our children and our children's children. So stop the stop the criticism and just come join us and by the way if you have a criticism we welcome criticism around here we're not trying to shut anything down but just make it be an informed criticism it can't be something like you know you come and it come from a political standpoint because remember what we're trying to do here is not to prop up a political party support a political party we're here trying to make sure that the people get what the government is supposed to provide for them service delivery right that's the main thing. Think about your roads. Think about your water. By the way, water, it was in 2016 in their manifesto that the JLP said they are going to build ponds. They're going to, be, they're going to be in, build reservoirs. They're going to end this, 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 this water problem. And the water problem is still with us. And whenever we get water from above, what happens? It turns out to be a disaster because we don't have proper drainage. So the roads become our drainage system. I mean, think about it, people. Is this the kind of government you want? I'm not saying that the PNP is any better. I'm not making that argument. All I'm saying is that you voted for this government. They've been there now seven years plus. And some of the things that they promised us back in 2016, well, a lot of things that they promised us in 2016, they have not accomplished, despite the fact that we have the money. We've been getting loans. We've been getting grants. Look at what's going on with national security. They can't say they don't have any money because the minister said said we have over a billion U.S. dollars to spend on plan secure Jamaica. And where did that where did that get us? I, I see pictures of police, a video of policemen pushing cars. And, and yes, they tell us we're going to have cars galore and then going to be new cars. And we're going to be doing this and we're going to be doing that. So those are just some of the thoughts that uh, I have regarding. Um, there's one more thing. This green paper and this white paper that... Rosalia mentioned, and I have copies of them. These are things that should have taken place back in 2016. The prime minister promised us that we're going to have job description for people so that they can do their job properly. And by the way, you shouldn't have to tell a politician that you should pay attention to your constituency. That's nonsense. You shouldn't have to put that on a piece of paper. That, that's a given. But it's in there. Right, that they have to pay attention to, to, to it, which tells me that they're not. Uh, so this job description thing, it, 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 it dovetails into the issue that the, the prime minister is saying, okay, we're going to, uh, the prime minister and the minister of uh, finance, that they've decided, okay, we're going to increase the salary for everyone. Even though he said, no, no, I don't want it. No, but initially he was going to take it, except for the backlash. But then they turned around and said, they, they, it's it, it's going to be retroactive because I think this thing came up, this increase in salary came up in 2021 and they didn't get it. So now what they're talking about is it, it's going to be, they're make, trying to make it retroactive. But think about it. He said, listen, we haven't been working because we haven't been getting a good salary. So like someone mentioned in the chat room, we're, if this had been private industry, could you imagine going to your boss and say, boss, I haven't been working, you know, because I, I, I don't think I'm getting a decent salary. So, you know, you need to pay me a good salary and make it retroactive and then I'll start working. I mean, think about the nonsense. And then they're trying to compare private, private sector with the government, saying that we have to match salaries and we have to do this and we have to do that. But things that they get away with in government, you could not get away with those things in the private sector. The prime minister himself would have been fired many moons ago, many, many moons ago. For the things that he's committed that we know of 
We're not even talking about the things that we don't even know about, that we're going to find out because of, of investigations we're going to conduct. But think about it, people. When they tell you this nonsense about we're trying to make the salaries comparable to private industry, then you ask yourself the question, well, wait a minute, in private industry, if you don't do this, you get fired. You don't do it in government, and then you want a raise, and then you want to compare to private industry. It doesn't make sense. Right. Could you imagine Could you imagine uh, the, the, the prime minister in, in, the, in the private sector, if he's supposed to do something, if he's supposed to turn in a document regarding his, his, his finances or whatever, he doesn't turn it in, or he turns it in, but it's, it, it can't be verified, and he still has the job for two years, he still has the job for two years, he'd be fired. And so this nonsense about trying to compare to private the private sector is 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 is, is just absolutely. absolute. If I let me jump in, uh, the, 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 and remember Please, one ahead. of the promises from 2017 was to within the first 100 days put an impeachment bill in place. So the comparable power to fire a non-performing um, elected official either through impeachment or recall it's not even on the table so you want you, you want private sector salaries and you want to peg at that level but you don't want private sector mechanisms to hold you accountable so that's a good point right so so that's something this is this is why for me the entire issue boils down to accountability measures and for me the core accountability measure is the mechanism in parliament to hold the executive accountable let me let me put it in historical context you know we moved from the monarchical arrangement um at independence and we kept the monarch but we kept a powerless mo monarch right a monarch who although in our constitution is an executive does not wield any executive power all of the power was given to the cabinet section 69 subsection 2 of the constitution makes it very clear that the cabinet is in control of government is the policy making arm but that same section talks about collective responsibility to parliament the clarity of what that means is not there so what has happened is since independence the executive the cabinet has unfettered power in fact i grew up in jamaica with the acceptance of the idea that cabinet decision is it if once they make a decision that's it you can't question it you can't do anything it's unfettered and so in fact the early constitutional discussions at independence saw the flaw in that provision um and the arrangements in, in in the constitution and and talked about an elective dictatorship a constitutional dictator that we were creating at the time and it's now becoming very clear after 60 years that if you do not have an effective mechanism to hold the prime minister and the cabinet accountable for bad decisions then we have a problem and so the discussion now in the constitutional reform, certainly from the perspective of the Advocates Network, we've made it, made it very clear in our press release that this accountability measures that the Prime Minister is talking about, by the way, he agrees with the need for the accountability measure, and he also conceded that it should have come first. He said it in one of his statements, right? That mm -hmm. matter must be solved in the Constitution. And unless it's solved in the Constitution, we're just going to keep repeating this problem of bad governance. Her? Yeah, Professor. Um, I'm wondering if they, the U.S. has been around for 300 years, let me say that. Jamaica has, has, has only been in business since 19, uh, six, what is it, 60 years, right? Mm -hmm. But the U.S. Constitution is, is independent and it, and it does have a Bill of Rights, citizen rights. We don't have to worry so much about uh, color, right? It, it, it's like 
things it, it, that they did in New York City with the um, the police commissioner setting up um, programs in New York City that target minorities. We don't have to worry about that if those techniques and tactics applied in Jamaica, right? It, what we worry about more or less is the fact that it would be aimed at underserved communities and the poorer people because you're not going to stop people coming out of Beverly Hills or Forest Hills willy-nilly and search their vehicles. It can happen, right? And you might be shocked what you find. But we have to apply the law and we have to apply a sense of accountability based on love of country, right? And that's what's missing. The, the abuse of country is, is so evident. And people are all about me, 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 me. What can I get? How much can I get? How far can I take this before somebody stops me? Right? But when you when you go out of your way to force accountability on these people, it's almost as if you're at war with them. And I don't understand why it should be like that. If it were based on love of country, loyalty to country, the only thing higher than your country is God. So is loyalty to your country. But I see where GLP members, party members, express this loyalty to bro God, to 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 <laughs> to different named individuals, and it doesn't make any sense to me. Do they understand? Do the people understand? Are they so simple-minded they can't understand what is needed and the intent of of a law and why the law should be enforced equally? Right, uh, it, it's 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 as if, um, and, and can the justice system appoint an ombudsman, somebody that can look equally with um, our friends in the Integrity Commission, a single person who's well staffed as an office that can go in and look at certain things money missing in a ministry you're going audit that ministry no questions asked right from the from the legal side from the justice side the judiciary because they're they're a member of the the trio that the, that creates good governance right we have to do unique things to stop this corruption my question is, do you believe the Jamaican people have an appetite to do the right things and to support the right things? And how do we, other than what we're trying to do with the legal fund, how do we get the Jamaican people to respond in that manner? How do we change that mindset? Yeah. Well, I absolutely believe that Jamaicans want to do the right thing and want a better country. Um, there are a few of us who are not doing the right things. And um, I don't believe that it's the majority of Jamaicans. So let's start there. Um, you raised the issue of the ombudsman. And I want to say that we are disappointed that since the resignation of the, uh, the end of, um, I think it was the end of the office, um, term of office of the ombudsman, we've not seen a um, a reappointment. Um, I th I think there is a uh, was a decision to perhaps integrate the, that office into the Integrity Commission. I'm not sure, but the fact that there is not a dedicated individual um, who is prepared to fight for the rights of Jamaicans um, is troubling, and I think that we want more um, institutions to protect rights than less. And especially in the context of this discussion now that seems to be undermining the legitimacy 
of the Integrity Commission in the eyes of the public, that is troubling. But you also talked about the rights, um, you know, comparable rights of, you know, freedom against racism and discrimination and so on. So our chapter three of our constitution provide such rights. Um, we have the freedom uh, against uh, discrimination on the basis of race, uh, um, you know, place of origin, social class, color, and political opinions. And that's embedded in our constitution. And um, so chapter three provides that. Remember chapter three was upgraded since 2011. And that's the major change that has taken place with respect to our constitution. And in that context, I want to make this point because when we are very critical of the government, we, we take for granted that right. And in some countries, this kind of conversation would lead to all of us being executed. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of the world as we know it today. And so it is something that all Jamaicans should feel proud of, that we have the right of freedom of speech and that is protected under our constitution. And for all of us who are active advocates and speaking loudly, and in some cases, some of us not saying some nice things, we are not summarily executed and that um, we, are, we, still, we still exist in this society. And so having said that, we have to do more to encourage Jamaicans to stand up, to recognize that this is a right that you have and you have to use it because when it's taken away is when we will realize that we're in problems and you don't want to get to that point. So we have to stand up and fight for these rights and remember that it is part of our role in a democracy. I, I want to say this. I have had members of go government said to me personally in Jamaica, keep up the good work because they understand that advocacy is a part mm -hmm. of governance. And so um, Jamaicans ought not to be afraid to stand um, firmly on the side of righteousness and, and, and integrity and, and honesty and anti-corruption. Those are principles we must be prepared to stand up and fight for. You know, um, Bob Marley and Peter Schott said, said, it best, said it best, stand up for your rights. And that was what that song was about, that we ought not to be afraid. So your, to your question, we have to do more to encourage Jamaicans to do the right things. I think they're willing, but the reality of the structures of governments, the, the, the embedded way, the way in which it's, it, the way in which this idea that, you know, cabinet, um, you know, call all the shots and that, you know, nobody questions a cabinet decision. Those issues now have to be um, looked at again. And we have to ask ourselves, are these principles and assumptions and rules in the constitution adequate for governance today? Last point on that, in the job description, you see um, um, repeated the idea of cabinet secrets and the confidentiality and so on. And in fact, the whole idea of collective responsibility is the idea that even if you differ in cabinet, you are collectively responsible for cabinet decisions. Um, and again, we in an in a era of open government and transparency and so on, we have to ask ourselves, um, does everything have to be secret? What about when oversight is taking place? when we have to question some decisions, can parliamentarians get access to cabinet documents in order to conduct oversight? These are questions we have to ask. And I suggest that in this discussion around the constitution, um, these are the issues that we have to settle. You know, uh, as I look through, I'm going through the, the, the ministry paper, and I'm just shaking my head because I wish I wish I had the uh, ability to show this to people. I and mean, what what at some point we're going to go through it, uh, maybe next week, line by line. 
I'm just showing you the nonsense that these people are saying that they're going to be holding each other to account. Actually, everyone is going to be accountable to the cabinet and the prime minister, right? So the question then is, who's the prime minister accountable to? Silence. Uh, I don't, it's silent on that. So, you, you know, when you, when you read this document, folks, you're going to shake your head and say, wait a minute, from 20, we've been waiting on this document from 2016, and this is the best they can do, a nine-page document. It's just nonsensical. Um, there are some good things in here, but I mean, for, I mean, it shouldn't take you what six, seven years to draft something like this. But, but uh, let me interrupt you and make this point, you know. But sure. the prime minister said in talking about it that everything in the terms of reference, um, in the job descriptions, are already in law or in the constitution. So, so why, why? <laughs> so note that, note that. So what they've done is pull it together, which is a good thing. I don't have a problem because it's all over different laws, constitutions, so on. What I would have preferred is if the references were made to the laws from which the, the elements were extracted. So for example, if you look in the, um, the um, green paper for the parliamentarians, you will see the um, reference to section 49 of the constitution and section 69. And the, in mm -hmm. those two cases, they pointed to the responsibility in the constitution of MPs to pass laws for peace, order, and good governance of Jamaica. And they also talk about determining the privilege and immunities. And of course, these are like the parliamentary rules. But with respect to that section, section 83, subsection 1, I suggest that we need to elaborate that some more. It's too aggregative. Let's get into the weeds. Let's talk about um, things mm -hmm. like the um, the concerns of the the extent to which the MPs become the voice of their constituents in Parliament, and let let us talk about the role of the citizen in um, as a matter of right, having opportunities to be part of hearings where the MPs can hear from us directly. Right. Because, you know, let's back up, you know, let's remember that um, in a democracy and in the republic we want to create where the Jamaican people are sovereign, we run things. Right. So the question is, what are the mechanisms in which we run things? And in a representative democracy, um, there are two mechanisms. One mechanism is that we our voice is heard through our members of parliament. Right. That's the that's what we understand. But there's also another mechanism in which the members of parliament enable us to have a direct voice. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be able to go to parliament and speak directly in the form of hearings. We ought to have mm -hmm. a mechanism in which we can recall the people that we put in power. We ought to have a say in our budget. And therefore we um, ideas like participatory budgeting ought to be part of these arrangements. And in some countries, participatory budgeting is part of our constitutional arrangement. So now, we have to be very thoughtful about how we put um, constitutional mechanisms in place, provisions in place that truly make the Jamaican people sovereign. And importantly, to your point, Herb, we have to find mechanisms in which the Jamaican people will make their voice heard. I recall in Paraguay, um, they came up with a participatory budget plan where the people of Paraguay can go online, look at the budget uh, proposals, they approve the, the portion that are approved and if government deviates from it they can raise the roof over the deviation why is if you put 10 million towards road improvement why is it now only five and you divert in five million and if it impacts their area they're on top of government uh, a lot of, uh, they'll take them to court, do whatever is necessary to make sure they follow the plan. Now, 
our Minister of Finance likes to talk and likes to show us a lot of flip charts and uh, neat little things he uses to explain his intent, right? But what I said a long time ago, don't just show us the flip chart and explain your intent. Open up your budget online so that we can follow and we can track. We can track the spending and we can ensure that the, there's adequate funding to that spending and that all of a sudden 14 billion Jamaican dollars don't go off and disappear come election time. And then the rumor mill has it that palms were being greased for votes, mm. right? Because that's not good governance. Right. And, and Herb, I should say this, that um, the power of people participation, citizen participation and advocacy mean that if the government is not providing that mechanism, we can provide it for ourselves. Right. And that, I have to say, is the work of the Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal, right? Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal JAMP yeah. is part of the Advocates Network, and they have a mechanism in which they can track the spending, right? Make the budget more transparent, and we can um, do a search, you know, uh, and find out exactly where the money, who got the contract, right? Yeah. Um, who has the largest contract, that kind of information. And I want to commend my sister, um, Jeanette Calder, for the tremendous work that she and, and the team at the at JAMP has done in bringing these tools to the citizen of Jamaica. And I come back to your point, Herb. What will it take for the Jamaican people to use it? So we're making it easier for you to track spending and to understand the budget and to understand where more of your taxpayers' money is going, right? But now we have to say to citizens, you have to get involved. And you have to understand the consequences of not getting involved. Because the more we step away from this arena, the more we see politics as dirty, I mean, I want to get involved, I mean, I want to get involved, I mean, I want to get tainted and all those kinds of things, then the more, the few people that are involved will do as they like. You know, um, Rosalia, I, I second the commendation of uh, Jeanette Calder and Jamp. They're doing a tremendous amount of work in educating the Jamaican people and, and, and at least trying to hold the government accountable and we need to support her and to support that organization absolutely because they're doing yeah they're doing great work i've worked with her and i've found her to be extremely professional dedicated hard working she knows what she's doing and she'll tell you that hey i'm not a lawyer i'm not a i'm not a i'm not a, she's an architect i believe yes, by, exactly. by training right. right by profession yes. but when you talk to this woman i mean you realize that the, the passion is there so much so that she's forced herself to, to accumulate as much knowledge as she can on the issues so that when she speaks about the issues, she does so in an intelligent fashion. Absolutely. And I, I love her to death. Yes, and, and but, I think that's, but, the, that's the idea. Every citizen has to be able to do that. Now, we're all not going to do it at the same degree and with the same level of passion, but we have to understand that we can only push the society forward when most of us decide to take on this role uh, a citizen advocate and take our role seriously in shaping this democracy. Let, let me say this, that, um, and I'm seeing it in the chat room, people are asking, and I've seen it now quite a few times over the past several weeks, months, where people have said that um, Jamaicans in general have not seen the constitution, have not read it, or if they've read it, they don't understand it. And I tend to agree. I don't know if it's most Jamaicans or a little, but I tend to agree that there are people who haven't read the Constitution. There are people who they've read it and they don't understand it. So what I'm going to do, family, and I started last week with the, the JAMP um, conduit to get to the Access to Information um, Act of 2002, where you can file uh, and ask the government for information. You won't get everything because there are nine exceptions, but there are some things that you can get. So in keeping with that, with that movement, with that tradition, 
with that example. Um, next week, we're going to start doing some stuff on the Constitution. Now, keep in mind that they're still trying to make changes. But while they're making changes, this is a document that governs what we do. We still have to live with it, right? So just because we hear that they're making changes doesn't mean that it, it's not applicable. It's still applicable. And, and, and by, by the time they get to making the changes, it's going to be a while because it has to be submitted in 90 days and it has to go to another body of government in another 90 days. And then some things have to come to the public as a referendum. So it's going to be a while. So we're going to start teaching bits and pieces of the Constitution that things that are applicable to our everyday lives. But let me read you what, what they said in the green paper, right? Job purpose. It says, members of parliament are first and foremost representatives of the people. They are elected or appointed to serve the interests of the public generally and the interests of their constituency in accordance with the greater good of the society or community and in keeping with the laws and constitution of Jamaica. Now, you heard that, and I'm sure you've heard it a million times, because every time a politician gives a speech, especially at the highest, the highest elements of, of our government, they say these things, but do they mean it? Do they comply with it? And I dare say that, no. So what we have to do is this. And what I would have loved to see in this document, and I don't know how it's possible to get it done, is to have community involvement. So instead of this floral language, and people don't know it, you know, oh, accountability, this and that and that, that can't feed people. I would like to see them put some goals and objectives. Say, okay, and, and this is where people have to be involved. They have to go to their MPs and say, listen, we need roads. So we want you to tell us now in a document, a social contract with us, what are you going to do in terms of getting our roads fixed? What about our health services? What about the education? What about housing? What about the infrastructure? I would like to see them get involved because what I would love to see is a document where a politician says, within the next two years, in my constituency, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to attempt to do this, whether I succeed or, or fail. But you're going to see my efforts. I would like to see the community hold them to something like that. We can't go on with this flowery language because this is not going to help us. And by the way, by the way, they don't follow this. They don't. We've seen it time and time again. They don't. And like, like, like you said, uh, Rosalia, some of these things, they're all over the place. So they brought it together in one document. But they weren't following it when it was all over the place. And one of the things is that you expect that your MP is going to know the things that he should know in terms of good governance. You expect that. You don't expect, you know, and, 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 and by, another thing that I've noticed, and I didn't see it in my organization, at least not much, is the blame game where you either blame somebody or you say, I didn't know, and that's supposed to cure the problem. Because in the FBI, I can tell you, they have, they have a rule, and it says that if there's an issue and you're in charge, you knew about it, or you should have known about it because you're the leader. That takes the blame off of the people at the lower level. It's like, no, if they, if whatever they do, it's because you allow them to do it or you weren't paying attention. And that's why we put you there in that big position and give you that big salary so that you can manage people properly and manage the issues. And therefore, we see where you're failing. And so we have to move you. We have to get rid of you. And that's what private industry does, by the way. It's all based on performance. What have you done for me lately? You know? You can't say, well, you know, remember last year I did this. And the private industry doesn't work that way. So if you're going to compare yourself to private in industry, like you said, Rosalia, then employ the mechanisms that they use for good governance in private industry and get rid of these people. Rosalia. Yes. Well, again, you know, um, it boiled down. I, I want to just comment on a point that was made in the chat about the fact that Jamaican people are beaten down. So we, we talk a lot about what needs to happen. And when it comes to taking it a step further, um, it's, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. But I am here to say it will get harder if we don't take an active stance. And, it, and, and it's what you can do in whatever way you can. On this matter of the salary increases, I'm say, I would have to say I am proud of Jamaicans for making their voice heard. The musicians have gotten involved. There are at least four songs that were created around the sal salary increase. I've seen poetry. I've seen videos. Um, you know, you guys have done a phenomenal job in terms of media influencers and your talk shows and stuff like that.
So we've all done what we can do. And we saw a little movement, not enough. And I couldn't help thinking that if we did more, you know, if more of us came out on the streets, if more of us started to really, you know, make, make, that, make that loud shout, then things could have been better. No, people are fearful and that's a reality. And that's one of the things we were not deterred in terms of the small numbers of people who were at the protest because many Jamaicans say, thank you for standing for us. Thank you mm. for keeping the fire burning. Um, and many of them are either employed in government and are afraid they lose their work. Some of them even in the private sector. And um, they, there is just general affair, fear. No, my point is we can't take that as given and as static. Um, things are changing. The society is changing. We're seeing things today we never saw before. And thank God there is social media. So my capacity to communicate to hundreds of people in the diaspora is now possible. Let's use it. Let's use it and talk to each other, explain things, deepen our understanding um, about how these things are done. Let me say that, you know, it, it, I think we should be fair enough to say that there are honest people in the government trying to do the right thing. They are. But it's very difficult. And if we're not constantly engaging people and encouraging them to continue to do the, the right thing and discouraging them from doing the wrong things, then, um, you know, things will just continue this way. And so what, what my message to all of us at home and abroad is, listen, get involved. Find a way to get involved. Um, I understand the concerns about losing your job and so on. And therefore, if you can't stand and march, then do some other things. Support in different ways. And, and, I, and I say that to not just Jamaicans at home, but Jamaicans in the diaspora. Um, find ways to support these efforts because it's through our collective efforts at doing the right thing to, sh to create a better Jamaica that we ultimately will change the status quo. All right, let's take a call. Uh, caller, you're on Reason with Rattigan. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello? Caller can't hear you. Um, hang up and call back, please. Well, it, well, well call. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, it's coming back. I'm sorry. Hello? Hello? Can I hear from a call at all? No, I was just going to comment on somebody was asking whether the protest made right. a difference. And I had raised it earlier that um, coming out of the protest, sustained protests in Jamaica for a month, mm -hmm. you know, talk show hosts, uh, letters to the gleaner and the and the observer um articles in the newspapers um you know street protests um all of that for one solid month right we ended our protest by the way with a funeral right and we buried um you know the the, the high morals that ought to be there in leadership and the principles that we didn't we have not seen in our political leaderships and we buried it and we said listen um perhaps they don't have it so let's just hold a funeral service and that's how we wrapped up our street protest now did it yield anything yes it did it has the conversation still ongoing today that's one more and more jamaicans are aware of what has happened and ultimately jamaicans will use that i think in making their decisions at the poll if and when, um, I shouldn't say if, I should say when time come, right? So that's one. Two, um, we have seen the rollback, right? Um, we've seen the rollback with respect to the prime minister. Not enough, partial, but it has saved the taxpayers over 100 and, 
10. Hello, good afternoon. Hold on one second. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, hold on one second. Let, let Rosalie finish the point. Yes, ahead, just, I'll just say the last quick quick point is that we've seen the job descriptions table in Parliament and we see that a joint select committee is being set up for the Code of Conduct. These were things that we demanded, we put on the table, and they're now a reality. So advocacy matters and we're not ease up. We're not ease up at all. Good. Carla, go ahead, please. Yeah, Rosalie, I already said something a while ago. I really have to call you. I'd like you to tell me which in the government, this government now, which person is a good person in this government? And I'd really like to find out one and tell me. When it's a good person, you mean good person or good politician? What do you mean? Good politician or good. No, she said there are good person in. Yeah. In uh, from a good person, you're supposed to be a good politician. Tell me which one. No, you have good people who are not good politicians, you know, because they do, being a politician, has, you have to have some gumption. You have to have the resolute. You have to be decisive. And some people are good people, and they don't have those qualities. But I find it hard to believe that you can't find one good person in the government that you can say, okay, this is a good person or a good politician. You may not see, but you, one of the things we should note is that there are several young politicians in the parliament today many of them are women remember today it's the first time we've seen so many women in parliament i'm not saying they're perfect i'm not saying that at all i'm just saying right. they they've come to politics they come because they're motivated to do the right things some of them are trying their flaws and all and i think we should i don't think it's important to name individuals i think i take the point that wilfred just made which is that it is very difficult to see to see any government anywhere in which everybody can be painted, should be painted with the same brush as not doing the right things and doing badly, right? Um, they get a collective um, assignment of not doing a good job then because collectively they have not moved the bar in the way um, the society wants. And so the responsibility is at their feet. They are the government. But well, I, I want to say that there are individuals who I think are trying and we should at least respect their efforts all right carl you get the answer yeah well you know which she she believed that but let me tell you something now mm -hmm. when when you are a good person it is in you from birth you have that nature you have that nature to be no matter what you're going to stand up you know, I'm a Michael Manley man. I don't afraid to talk, right? Mm -hmm. When he was running, he said, look, you see me? Me no want no fancy car. Me no want this. Me no want that. I'm there with the people. Right. I'm going to, I want to see the people and achieve things. He said, I, 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 didn't really, I, I could even send you a video with him saying that. He said, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. I don't want a fancy car. I don't want this. Till I, you know, he's looking, I want it to go to, to the standing tech. They go, I was assassinating him. I don't know to remember that. Mm -hmm. They go to all assassinate Michael Mandy to always stand up for the poor people. That's why the private sector didn't like him more than so, because he stand up for the poor people and him talk. He taught the truth. Mm -hmm. He doesn't hide. You know, go him back, him just taught the truth. I mm -hmm. said, Look, I'm saying, anybody in my party want to drive this and want come out. That's why him and PJ did follow to any time. Yeah, but, but right? here's the thing. Here's the thing, though. That's just one style of governing. It's not the only style of effective governing. Um, so while you use Michael Manley as an example, and might very well be a good example, there are other people whose style, you know, their styles are different, but they're equally effective. So while I agree with you, I, I, I tend to think that, you know, even in the JLP, you have some good people, you have some good politicians here. It might be difficult at this point to, because of everything that's going on to, point to one person and say, okay, this guy's a good guy. But, you know, it, 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 it's hard to, to just paint the entire party like that to say, well, you know. But yeah, I, I, I agree with what you said, but one person, and they get rid of him very early, out of the party, Donald Sansa. That man, it was a good man, Donald Sansa. Right. He was a good, and he was so good, within the party, they get rid of him. All right. I wouldn't even bother go down that road. But right. Donald Sansa was a good man. I am telling you that. Mr. Strickland and Michael Mandelman, which is when he comes to that answer, mm -hmm. I backed him. Well, you know what I like about you? That you're not partisan 
too much because while you're a Michael man, the man, you still point to Donald Sangster who's a JLP yes. uh, person to say, hey, this person is a good person, you know? So um, you show some balance and some objectivity there. So right. you're consistent. And I just quickly pick up a comment about the fact that we've had the uh, historical number of women in parliament and they've not made much of a difference. And I want to agree with the comment there because um, we were very disappointed when we saw that viral video of a man beating a woman and the allegations mm -hmm. that it was George Wright. And we felt that, many of us, um, that we should have felt the weight of the women in parliament on that matter. True. And we think it I is still it. unacceptable that two or three years later, um, the person who is accused of being the man in the video has not been able to say to the country, it was not me. It wasn't me. Right. And that's unacceptable. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I think Shaggy said it appropriately. It wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me. Just tell us that. And he can't yes, do that. Just, That's a problem. Let me do something else. You know, the, the government, with all the, the, the bright people that have all the money they're spending on these reports, they need to do something about, uh, first of all, making sure that things are correct. Because there's so many, I found like two typos in this already. There's a typo on page three, and there's a typo on page uh, seven. All right? If you're going to put it out, put it out correctly. All right? The other thing is that what I don't see in this, what I don't see is, I don't see consequences. In this document, yes, I don't think I don't. Yeah, and, and the prime minister right. talked about it too. You know, remember he talked about there will be consequences, there will be fines and stuff like that. I don't see but consequences don't see, in yes, this. It's not attached in that kind of way. And bear in mind, you know, remember we always should remember this as we go through the job description. Prime minister said that these are already rules. This is just a summary. You just pull it together. They are already the rules required by MPs and um and ministers in the constitution and in law. And so, for example, there are penalties associated to um, missing um, parliament without a legitimate excuse, right? So he's simply repeating again, in that instance, a law that already exists. Now, are we enforcing it? That's another matter. Yeah, here's, here's another. By the way, Tony, you called twice and, and we were unable to connect. You can call now, the line open. But here is something for... All of my family members and for listening to this thing in job purpose. This is coming out of the, the green paper, right? It says this public role, and they're talking about doing, you know, working and doing good for the community and the constituents. It said this public role requires parliamentarians to be mindful that conduct in their personal capacity. You're talking about the gentleman uh, uh, who beat up the woman, um, must uphold and seem to be and be seen to uphold integrity, dignity. And professional stewardship befitting the public office. Are we doing that? Boy, um, you know, that's the issue on the table. You know, one of the things that we have not seen, and I come back to the matter of George Wright, that um, the matter ought to have been taken to the disciplinary committee. So the arrangements in parliament to hold their peers accountable for acts that could bring the parliament in disrepute is not even working because the house leader has not taken the, um, the, 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 the request that was made by the opposition to take the, the matter to um, the disciplinary committee and it has not reached. So what, what, when you what, see what, things like that, you, 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 you wonder. What was the result of the police report? Well, remember they dropped the matter. The police did. Mm -hmm. Both no, both both parties involved. Yeah, right, yeah. And it couldn't go any further. But the, the does, the, the, does that mean the police have to drop it if they both drop it? They 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 the 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 police argued that the information from the video video was inconclusive and apparently I don't know if there was an issue of the source of the video, but certainly they could not make out um, you know, details and so on, and they dropped the case. They just didn't have any, they, they, they did provide it, they made a statement but that, it, you, have enough you, information. As, as a computer science person, you know fully well that if that man had his cell phone on him, that cell phone was pinging off a tower that gave a precise location at that time. Exactly. And they could have tracked and traced that quite so, easily. 
Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, the police have to act with integrity as well. Again, unless he's gonna say, again, I'm sorry, no, I just want to say, and again, another matter in which um, the members of parliament ought to be able to hold some kind of investigation, yeah. and that is why it was important to go to the um, disciplinary committee, and it did not. Unless he's gonna say, Herb, that that his phone was being used by a man who looks like him, but it wasn't <laughs> him, you know? unless he's gonna come and and and, and to answer your question about um, the 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 dpp or prosecutors moving forward mm -hmm. they could have moved forward without those people as witnesses because essentially you're talking about a crime that's that, that's committed against the state right right so even though she could have sued him civilly you know the state could still say that we saw an assault and so we're going to prosecute but you, you know and this idea that in this day and age with the technology we couldn't make out who this person is yeah and, and Ingrid, Ingrid is saying he still sits in parliament, and I'm going to add, and he's going to get 20 odd million dollars. Yes. Touche. Right? This is the reality. You know, it's it's unacceptable, unacceptable behavior. Why should taxpayers be paying somebody who cannot tell the country that I, it was not me? Just a simple statement. It wasn't me. Why can't you do that? And then we're turning around and we are giving you 20 something million dollars. Something is wrong with that. I say, the Jamaican people, we need to demand more. You know, with the time we have left, and uh, we don't have much time, um, I'd like, Herb, if you don't mind, I'd like you to just give an overview of the Institute and the fantastic work it, it, it does, particularly this time of the year, every year where it has a week um, putting on all of these programs so that parliamentarians can understand what's going on in the Caribbean and how they can support our efforts. And, and your takeaways from, from the programs uh, this week? Well, the, 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 hold on. I think Tony can Let me see if this works. Yeah. Tony. Hello. Tony? Yeah, greetings. Yeah, greeting. Greetings. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. And the list still Yeah. Yeah, she's still here. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've, I've been through some, some research and um, I, I, I discovered some important information here concerning what they're calling the, the Constitutional Reform Committee. I would, I would like to make a controversial statement that Jamaica does not have a constitution because the, by, the, by the legal name of the document is is order in, order in council 1962 that is the name of the document by order the in council okay 62 mm -hmm. the word the word constitution is in bracket and from a, from a legal perspective anything that is in bracket is on the paper it's just there as a reference the mm -hmm. document is not name a constitution by legal Definition. Okay, and you mentioned this and, to, to, the, to the to the um the constitutional committee, and what did they say to you? Oh no, this this is a recent this is a recent information that I dig up. Okay, okay. The question that they asked them was what was wrong with independence that they are leaving it and running to republic, and they didn't they didn't give an answer. Oh, the question you asked the the, 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 the the Constitutional Committee that's looking at amending the Constitution is what was wrong? What's wrong with the Constitution that they're running to? Go ahead. What's wrong with independence? What was wrong with independence? That they're running away from it. Okay. And they haven't responded to you yet? No, Miss Mala will for no answer. Okay. Whenever she does, please give us a call and let us know. Um, I suspect that she has a lot more. She don't know. She what? She, she don't know. She, she skillfully avoid answering the question. And 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 the, 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 the meeting that they keep in Kingston, a young lady asks her, what will it be the process to secure the sovereign rights of Jamaica? Because in a real republic, the people's sovereign rights are secure by a constitution. And she don't answer that question either. All right, here's what I'd like you to do, because we're running out of time. What I'd like you to do is 
all the questions that you submitted to them and you have not received a response, kindly send them to me and we will look into it for you. Okay. All right. So look, take care of yourself. Have a great weekend. We'll talk next week. All right. Cool. All right. So the caller is yeah. right that we are, we, the constitution, what we call the constitution is an order in council, which is a legal document in the British parliament and part of the move to the Republic and the reasons for the constitution reform is to, as the minister puts it, um, and other um, previous um, discussions about the constitution to Jamaicanize it and to ensure that the constitution is an act of our Jamaican parliament. Nonetheless, it doesn't negate its role in the law in our country as the highest set of rules that guide our country. It doesn't negate that. Although it is technically um, an order in council, which is a British legal framework, it has been treated as and adopted as um, our constitution and serves that way. We, you should remember, I think you, of course, know this, um, Wilfred, that countries like Britain does not have a written constitution. Our constitution, yeah. And therefore, it doesn't mean that they don't have a constitution. It's just that it's not written and it's not tangible. So um, by convention and other mechanisms, we have, um, you know, people have adopted documents and rules and norms um, as the constitution. And therefore, it doesn't mean that because it's an order in council, that it has no validity and it ought not to be treated as a constitution. True. That would be a wrong yeah. conclusion. But it is a good point to observe because it's a reason why we, the people, need to create a constitution that is of us, for us and by us and that constitution must be an act of the jamaican parliament okay herb you want to go ahead with uh, what you were about to start before we got the call yeah you know the 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 caribbean um act was signed back in 2016 the public law 114-291 that allows us input into laws and into policies that impact the Caribbean. And Dr. Nelson, Dr. Clara Nelson has been um, overseeing the Institute of Caribbean Studies, uh, I would say since 1991. Um, and, mm -hmm. and pretty much her vision is what we're seeing come bearing fruit today. Where different yeah. policies, whether the policies concern health um, or it concerns uh, agriculture or it concerns crime and security, um, trade, um, and she's a futurist, so she's looking at uh, space and the use of space um, uh, that could benefit the Caribbean. Um, the blue economy and, and the use of the ocean, which surrounds all of the uh, Caribbean area. Um, we, 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 each year, we look at everything and we look at the advancements being made. And we look at where the Caribbean is compared to where the rest of the world is, basically. Not just where the U.S. Mm -hmm. is, but where the rest of the world is. And this is how we mm -hmm. can gain insight and knowledge to be able to suggest changes to crime and security in my portfolio. Um, since 2016, we came in there and we introduced um, the uh, Cyberpol to the government. At the time, Cyberpol had a supercomputer that could detect um, cyber attacks on the horizon. That didn't impact Jamaica as yet, but it could impact other areas within the Caribbean, right? The things that you're seeing happening today with AI, we were way ahead of that, right? We could do things with that supercomputer that would intercept a lot of the cyber attacks that slammed Jamaica 
um, especially the one that almost took down the um, stock market in Jamaica. Right? Mm-hmm. That's one of the reasons why I introduced that uh, to them down there in Jamaica. But they understood clearly that they needed the fusion center the, where you can gather a lot of information on people. Because people are the ones that create the mischief, right? And and the, the, this system could almost forecast uh, predictive policing where crimes are going to occur based on the situations that were fed into it, right? If you have NIDS, for example, as the data set within this computing system, and NIDS understands the portfolio of every citizen in Jamaica, then it becomes more predictive. Because if you shoot my brother, the system is going to tell you, well, this guy is propensity to commit serious crimes about against the people who sh- shot his brother um, is pretty high and it's, and it's going to happen. So it's only a matter of time uh, when it's going to explode. But when we bring these things to legislative week and we're speaking to our legislators, our Caribbean and our Hispanic legislators, it's to give them the opportunity to even understand technologies themselves. Because mm-hmm. they don't know everything about um, the blue economy and how we need to recover um, our uh, ocean, the, the dumping in the ocean, and the, all the plastic um, that's floating around the Caribbean, and the fact that we're losing beachfront and, and how we need to recover uh, that beachfront. There's a lot of things we explain to them. Um, and, and, and around the time of uh, COVID, same thing. How would COVID impact each island? And what does each island need to help it? And, 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 and we promote more funding from USAID as well as State Department to address specific problems that are affecting Caribbean islands, right? And, and again, you got uh, people like um, the Dr. Ivan Ellis, former Secretary of State, mm-hmm. Policy planning staff. A lot. Good guy. Good guy. Very interesting guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Attorney Bruce Zagaris from the Another Caribbean Policy Consortium, right? Who told you about the kleptocracy. Uh, kleptocracy, law. right. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and Professor Ivlaw Griffith mm-hmm. from Guyana. From Guyana, who wrote mm-hmm. uh, a paper on the guns and the gun trafficking um, in the Caribbean, right? Um, Daniel Silva, who spoke about Haiti. And the problems mm-hmm. in, in Haiti and how 11 million people, Haiti is the most dominant population in CARICOM, right? We were the ones that pro- poked uh, the CARICOM impacts, who's supposed to be the principal trainer for law enforcers in the Caribbean. We had to poke them into action to upgrade themselves and come alive and start doing the job properly. Because they were asleep. They didn't have any cyber experts. They weren't given sufficient uh, training uh, around the Caribbean or calling in the um, uh, commissioners and uh, uh, some of their sub officers often enough to train them in specific areas. So the the bottom line is um, we look at we're looking now at CBSI, Caribbean Basin Security Initiative. And we're saying to them, CBSI is all about protecting the United States borders. We have responded to that because we talk about this, the southern border, right? And we talk about how we can do different things to stop the drugs from coming in, right? Interdicting drugs. But now they want us to interdict people because of the human trafficking and the, the amount of people mm-hmm. coming in. But we said, wait a second. You allowed weapons to leave the shores of the United States. And these weapons went in through Haiti and other countries. And it's flooding the entire Caribbean. 
and we need you to do your part to step up your activities and because of us pushing back now and saying what are you doing to stop this and then the conference in trinidad and tobago a month or two ago that addressed that directly and those prime ministers came out and finally echoed a lot of stuff we in ics were saying right so we know that we're making an impact and we know that we uh when we speak we get collective information from our diaspora from different associations across the various caribbean islands doesn't even have to be caricom at times but we we even help out some of the african states because they want to know how do we form this organization and how do we help each other so the the, the bottom line is even now caricom is speaking to the au right and the Afri- is it region six region i think it's region we are all members of region six of the african union mm-hmm. right all black people in the western hemisphere regardless of where you are so the bottom line is we are pushing and we have suggested that the african union have enough uh french-speaking countries that can form the 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 leading force that you would need to go into haiti not to attack Asians, but to practice peacekeeping, peacemaking, and, and nation building within Haiti. Oh, right? Uh, Caller, yeah. go ahead, please. Yeah, good evening. Good Mr. evening, sir. And uh, her, yes. this lady, um, Rosalie. Rosalie. Rosalie, good evening to you, Rosalie. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I was just, I, I, I catch you late again today. I was trying to see if I could start there, but I catch you late. That's all right, no problem. I heard Rosalie was speaking about the, demo, the demonstration and all of that. Um, are people in Jamaica, I mean, people in the diaspora are trying to do what they can, but there's a code of conduct that um, the prime minister had brought about in 2016. And um, we have seen nothing where that is concerned is doing. One of the next thing I want to ask, what are we doing? Isn't that the Jamaican people cannot stand up to say, well, then, Mr. Prime Minister, we need to see a dec- I, um, your, your um, what's you call it? His... Um, oh, statutory declaration. Yeah, the statutory declaration. Mm-hmm. That is something because when we look at it, I was just looking at something today when they're saying that there are five what, entities in Jamaica that is corrupt, the, the police and all of that. But look, if you have a corrupt government, you cannot say the police and the, the police is corrupt. You cannot say this um, other entities are corrupt when, when if the, the head of the stream is corrupt, then you're going to have a, it's coming down. So we need to put most of the blame on the prime minister, whoever they might be, from the PNP side or the labor right side. Mm-hmm. We need to put that emphasis on that because they are the head of the stream. So if you're going to say the police is corrupt or you find, say, the um, teachers or whatever need corrupt, you're going to have to say the government and the there is corrupt. They are the corrupt one because if they are not corrupt, then the rest of the people wouldn't be corrupt. So are we going to... I see some, you put some last out. Then can we not force the, the, the prime minister to declare his assets and how, where they come about, especially his wife? This is one of the main things that we, what, which I think, I personally believe that should be focused on. All right. Thanks. Listen up for the answer. All right. Let me just go to yes, this yes. call. All right. Caller, welcome to Reason with Rattigan. Go ahead. You're live. Um, Hello? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit curious. Um, I notice we, we do a lot of talking, you know? But I think it's time for action. Because we just keep talking, talking, talking. I, I have an idea. And tell me if you guys agree with me. You can you hear me? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Go ahead, please. Why don't we people in the diaspora... Okay, Jamaica have three counties. Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. Why can't we just adopt one of the county 
I would just fix it to a first rural. I don't think we need the prime minister or to do that. All Why right. can't we just fix one of the county? Uh, one. Uh, uh, well, is that the only point you want to make? Because I want to throw this out to the to, to Rosalie and, and Herb and get their take on it. Yeah, because uh, it is so easy. I, you know, my thing is this. They said if you plant a pumpkin seed and if you make the land fertile enough, it will grow. Uh -huh. If all of us unite and we decide, say, okay, the easiest county to fix, maybe is Surrey, and we just come together, bypass the prime minister, bypass the politics, and we just go in and we just fix one of the county. All right. That, that's just a, one. All right. That, that's, 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 that's a fair point. But let me throw this out to you before uh, I, I bring uh, Herb and, and Rosalia in. You, 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 in a general way, you said, okay, instead of complaining, and I agree with you, we should, we should, we should take action to, to address the problems. And you're saying we have three counties, and so we should just unite, and then we should just fix the easiest county to fix, and then, exactly. and then move on. Now, let me ask you this question: How do you propose doing that? Well, there is enough Jamaicans, so what we could do, we could get all right. We need our own police chiefs. We just need people who to volunteer, like people who run city in well, Europe, yeah, United no, States. Hold, yeah, yeah. hold on one second, Carla. You said we need our own police chief. You mean the diaspora or, the, or Jamaica? The diaspora. Forget about Jamaica. They so, will follow us. So we, need, we we just, need, so we need to get a police chief in the diaspora to do what? That's what I'm saying. Okay, we choose a county. We say, okay, we're going to fix this county. Okay. And we, we pull our resource. Yes. And we say, okay. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to make preparation for all the people who is going to volunteer their time. For oh. all departments, what we're going to create? We're going to create department, school board, and we just need people from the diaspora to come in. And they give us six months, they give us a year, and we, you know, we provide them with place to live, transportation to go to work, and all exact departments, we're going to use people from the diaspora. All right. Well, let me, tell you, let me tell you one thing, and then I'm going to ask Rosalia to comment. Um, that 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 county that you say would be easy, it would be yes. the most difficult because everybody would move from the other two counties, go over there. So them since the things are happening. No, no. But <laughs> uh, and that's the thing, though. All right, let me give you. An All right. Hold on, before you go any further, let me let me ask Ro Rosalie and and her to make some comments. Hold the line, please. Rosalie, okay. what do you think about that idea? Uh, well, let, let me start with what's happening now. Um, the diaspora is doing an amazing job to intervene at small scales in communities. Um, but if you ask the people who are doing that, they can tell you some of the challenges on the ground. And some of them is how do you interface <clears throat> with the, the public sector? Because you have to, for example, if you want to fix roads, you can't just walk into Jamaica and fix roads. And Jamaicans who live there can't simply fix roads. You, there's a whole ministry set up with responsibility to deal with that and you have to interface with them and so it's that interface with the established public sector the people who are charged to doing that that you get problems and there's very little that you will do that is devoid of that interface um you need permits to bring stuff into the country um you need licenses in some cases and so on so i i, I I don't think that the solution is simply um, a set of people from outside Jamaica to come and fix it. In fact, that was the history of colonization, right? Mm -hmm. Where other people who have ideas about how you ought to live would simply come and tell you what to do. Um, that's not the way. Jamaicans who live there have their own ideas about how we want to fix the country. And the best solution is that for the diaspora to work with Jamaicans who are on the ground, in the trenches, trying to do stuff, and let us collaborate to get it done. That's where I see some effective changes taking place right now. Okay. Herb? Look, he's talking about, I understand what he's saying with regard to the, the um, Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. Because what we were, were saying to the Jamaica government when we went down was in fact that in order 
to break up the... Well, we can speak up a little bit louder. Uh, your voice cannot lower on the... Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes, sir. Okay. We're saying in order to break up the crime that goes across Jamaica, um, that, that a police officer wearing uniform can transport ganja in a police pickup from Kingston all the way to Hanover. And it's only in Hanover a curious police uh, team stopped him because he was out of place. They realized the markings on the vehicle was from Kingston and he was there two, three o'clock in the morning at the wharf unexplained what he was doing there uh, in uniform. And he was not on any spe special mission, right? So in order to break that up, you probably need a unique feature. Like, you know, we have here, what do we have here? We have a sheriff department in the county, right? And we have a separate county system for court in each county. So is it possible we can have a similar setup to have Cornwall with his own um, justice system and police, Middlesex and Surrey the same, right? Simply by changing the color of the uniforms and to make it impossible that these cops would leave from one end of the island to the next to commit um, crime or support organized crime or have the means to investigate not 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 having investigation conducted by area police within the jcf by but uh, area of the county investigating organized crime and breaking it up within the county the, you know, okay. that you know you have to have some some um uh independence uh degree of independence to allow a, the court system of that county to rule on crimes that occur in that county and that way the county can um various projects uh with the, with the restitution being made from proceeds of crime all right let, let me throw my two cents in color before i have you make your you know your last points um, okay. And also, I see some people in the chat, and they're saying that basically we need to take action. Too much talking, talking, talking. Well, yes, too much talking. But, yeah, but but hold on, yeah, because one of the things about talking is that we get to understand each other and we get to identify the issues before you can't just willingly go out and just start act. You know, you have to talk and identify the issue and come up with a strategy. One of them is for the people who don't think that we're doing anything is the ATI Act, where you can actually go to the government. And you can actually ask for information so that if you want to make an argument, if it's not, if, it, if the information doesn't fall within one of the nine exceptions, you'll get the information. Like I've done it and I've gotten information that, that helped me in my lawsuit against the minister. The second one is lawsuits. You know, you don't have to wait for five years uh, to hold the government responsible just at election time. There are ways you can do it before that point. And the access to information is one way. Carla, uh, there's a lot of noise coming on your end. If you could just move, yeah. mute your mic for a second, please. So, okay. yeah, the ATI is one way. Lawsuits, that's another way. Um, elections, that's another way. Uh, the foundation is another way where we said, okay, what we're going to be doing with the foundation is we're, go we're going to, and I hope that whoever has, whoever is strongly of the view that we need to start taking action that they will support the foundation because we're going to be filing lawsuits. We're going to be doing, uh, 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 taking a course of PR action. And we're also going to be doing investigations on some of these corrupt politicians. Some of them we know, we already have information regarding their assets outside the country. All right. And I know they're worried when they hear this because it's who they are. But it's going to be more comprehensive. It's going to be more focused when we start the foundation. We're going to do actual reports on these people. And regarding your point, uh, uh, caller, about Cornell Middlesex, sorry, there's such a thing called an election, right? And we elect a government to provide services. 
And so for us then to say, okay, you know what? We know that there's an election and we know that they have a government, but we don't think the government is doing what it should be doing. So we're going to step in, to be honest with you, while it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a novel idea, I just don't see how it's going to work within the construct we have. Where you said you, we want to have our own police chief, we want to go in and fix roads, and 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 Rosalia spoke to that issue, saying that you know it's just it's going to be virtually impossible for us to do it. Now, what you can do is you can adopt a school, you can adopt a, a neighborhood, for example, and you can go in and you can you can provide books and you can do this and you can do that. But once you start talking about the scheme of governance now, where you're saying, okay, for police purposes, we're going to have our own chief and we're going to go and, and keep in mind also that Minister Chang, this is what caused him, still is causing him some grief with the diaspora because he told us in no uncertain terms that I don't want any help from on the outside. If you want to come and make a speech, we will approve that, but we're not going to work with you. And guess what? We can't force him. There's nothing we can do to force him right now. Now, what the people of Jamaica can do to force him is they can vote. They can vote. They say, okay, you don't want to work with the diaspora. We want to work with the diaspora. So guess what? We're going to vote you out. We're going to have somebody else in who's okay. more, who's, who finds that, that, that argument more palatable. It goes down well with them. And so we want to get all the assistance we can get. So that's my two cents. So Carla, uh, respond quickly, and then we have to move on. Okay. Uh, let me give you a little, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little scenario. Uh, yes. And what do you think about this? Okay. If you take the worst, if you take the worst Jamaica, nasty, vile, and if you if you give that person a visa to go to any other country, now on the way to the airport, that person buy some box food and he eat and he throw that thing through the window, you know, in pee on the side of the road. As soon as that person reach the airport that person change and when he step off in a new york city if you give that person a beer to drink you find the first garbage can to throw that trash in now jamaican people need hope we need a little hope and what better hope to give them more to fix one of the county but you but you're gonna and, need the government. i'm sorry to interrupt you you're gonna need you're gonna need the government at some point, at least from the. At yes, least from the but but, but uh, um, Mr. Ratti, this is where okay. If we come together and we pool our money, and we go in and we say, okay, we're gonna fix account. Now we're gonna choose, you know, the government office and you know the city hall and all of those things right there. You know, we're gonna start out. We're gonna select a group of people who's gonna lead, and then after the first four years, then we're gonna have our own election to start select people to do what so you're talking about a government in exile and you're talking about a government from overseas exactly and that's what i'm saying all right now here's the problem right. here's the first problem i have with that you remember now there is a budget in jamaica taxes are being collected in jamaica and if you're saying that we in the diaspora we're going to put our money and we're going to take care of all of these things what's going to happen with that money that's sitting there that's you know, not being used well but but this is where you know Mr. Ratigan, remember, you know, as 60,000 Chinese in 50 years, it takes 60,000 Chinese to bring China to where they are today. 60,000 of them from the diaspora. Right. 60,000 of them go back home and look at China today. Why can't 60,000 of us go home and do the same thing? Besides, we keep talking. Yes. No, no, no. I agree with you. No. Going home and trying to make a change at home. That's different from saying in the diaspora, we're going to do all of these things. There's a big difference. If you go back as a returning resident and you say, I'm going to make a contribution to my country, that's different from saying, well, we're going to have an organization overseas that will then dictate to the Jamaican people and the Jamaican government about what we're going to be doing, our priorities, because at the end of the day, who's going to be who's going to be calling the shots? Will it be the government in Jamaica or the government outside of Jamaica? No, no. But, but, but listen what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. but, 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 Mr. Radigan, people will fall in line. People need hope. People just need to see, I promise you, people just need to see some progress. And you see how people fall in line. No, I'm, not, I'm not saying people don't need hope. I'm asking you for the mechanism within which you, it will work. That's what I'm asking you to explain. Because I like the idea, but I don't, I don't see a pathway okay. to it being... Okay, good. okay. All right. You, take for instance St. Elizabeth. Okay. The basket, the basket of the the, the country. Talk to me about St. Elizabeth. Come, my mother come from St. Elizabeth. Talk to me about St. Elizabeth. 
So you hear what, you hear what I would do if I, if I was in Jamaica? First of all, food security, when Jamaica needs food security. So we need, we, we need maybe like a 50,000 square foot building where we can start store food. And the moment we start to do that, that foreign exchange and all of those things is going to stay in the country. So let's say we say Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. Okay, we're going to take Surrey. That four, that four parishes were included in that country right here. We're going to secure that. We're going to need people from here um, to, to all major departments. What we're going to need, we're going to need the head, somebody from out of the country, who people are going to follow. Mm -hmm. We have we have like a city hall where we meet and we make whatever you know. We have we have a police chief who, I mean, the government can have their own police, but our our police chief only gonna respond for those four parishes. The regular police can bypass just like you don't have the sheriff and you have the city police and you have the sheriff. So that means that we would have like a city police department where we responsible for those police, not the government. But here's the thing. There is a law in Jamaica that says the JCF is the is the is the law enforcement arm of the government of, of the government of the people of Jamaica as well. How would you get around that by saying we we in the diaspora we're gonna put our own? And I'm gonna tell you. And I'm gonna tell you. Okay. The prime minister not a bad person, but his hands are tied. You know when people have secrets for you, you can't get to do what you need to do. He need help to start make some serious decision. If we go at him, if we go at him in this way, not not gonna be done. We have to show him that okay, we are here for you, and you, you need to make this decision. But he can't do nothing now because all of those people are running a oh. secret for him. All of those people, so we need yeah. to help him to make that decision. So we have to free him up where yeah. he can make those decisions. Yeah. And I promise you, the moment the prime minister start to see what we're doing, and he start to see that, to to trust me, he will give you all the help you need. This guy, okay. all right. Well, I tell you what, I tell you, I, well, I tell you what you do, right? Um, because I'm looking at the chat, and some people, I think some people support the idea that you're proposing, and some people that think that while it's a good idea, it won't work. So, what, I, what I'd like for you to do is come back next week, right? And if you okay. can, and then give me a give me a give me like a um, a schematic, give me blueprint. A, a blueprint. blueprint. Ah, there you go, you took the words on. Give me something like that and show me how it would work right and then we can we can talk about it and then we get everybody to come in and, and and kind of make their contribution to the conversation because this is a good conversation but i just happen to think that it, it we don't have a mechanism to make it work it's a good idea yes. but we don't have a mechanism yes. but you're saying there is a mechanism and what we have to do is get the prime minister in, uh, uh, on board maybe not this of prime course. minister because you said we, maybe not this prime minister because you said too much people have secrets for him and you can't have a prime minister where people have secrets for him for, for trying and do this because you know there'll be obstacles in the way. But I tell you what, work on that idea and then let us start next week. All right, boss. All right. Take care of yourself. All right. Be well. Yeah, man. All I'll right. All right, my brother. All right. Yeah, yeah Rati, uh, uh, Professor. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I, I said a while ago. Would they entertain the idea? The JCF is. Uh, is from the old days, slavery days, roundup days, and you know the the force idea it doesn't exist anywhere else, maybe not uh, Northern Ireland. To have a police department now is 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 much different. That serves and answers to the citizens where they serve. Would they entertain the idea of? empowering counties having a county seat of government that could handle its own health affairs i mean mimic what we're doing here in the u.s health affairs um, crime and security uh justice um have its own county uh county council county commissioners right would would that effectively take the population of three million people and how many million outside when they come home that you could have effective governance at the county level and yeah. and take the 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 temptations away from a, a national government matter of fact you could even shorten parliament here mm -hmm. in virginia i always tell people 
the parliament here, the, the House of Delegates and the Senate meets January and February. That's it. They have 10 months in their communities and they have uh, 10 months that they can sit on committees. But then they only come and they vote things into law or out of law January and February of each year. And they only make 17 or to 20,000 US dollars. They're not into 200,000 like uh, our friends in Jamaica. And, it's, and it, 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 it's the most, it's the best run uh, state in the country. We always have a surplus. Oh, your state, your state? Virginia, yeah. Welcome to Maryland. <laughs> Mar Mar Maryland needs help. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, well, let me say this. Um, you know, now is a good time to engage these kind of conversations because we're in the throes of constitutional reform. It right, does sound exactly. like we yeah. you're talking about creating new institutions. And as you're talking, I think about how it would have to interface with local government because those are existing institutions. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of thinking about how we could improve local government. So these are the kinds of things that is worth debating, discussing, and thinking through carefully. Um, <clears throat> yes, I know we all want to act, but um, sometimes, especially in these novel ideas, we have to talk it through. But I want to say something based on what the last caller said, that <clears throat> a lot of the things that, remember, if we see ourselves as family, right? We're, we're a Jamaican family. The Jamaicans in the diaspora are just living one side of Jamaica <laughs> and we are living on the mainland, right? right. Um, many of us um, are living in both places. And so I think it is imperative that whatever we do must um, dovetail and must be linked to <clears throat> the efforts of Jamaicans on the ground who are trying to do similar things. The, the limitation, for example, for me as a citizen, I can tell you I'm currently involved in, in a discussion about roads, the roads where I live. And I we are a citizen trying to fix it, and it's an ongoing dialogue with the state. We can't simply just go and just fix a road and ignore what the government does. So, and the same, you from um, the diaspora can't simply do the same thing. So we have constraints and challenges that you have. So I think the best thing is for us to collaborate, to find people in Jamaica who share your views and want to do the same things you want to do or similar things, and let's work together. All right. Okay. Herb, hold on one second. Caller, go ahead, please. You're live on Reason with Rattigan. Mr. Rattigan, I live in uh, Canada, and my issue for the last little while that burns me up is whenever I get to Montego Bay Airport, and I see this lineup that says Jamaicans um, and Caribbean nationals and foreigners. And every time, because I have a, a Canadian passport, they shunt me off into this foreigners lineup. And I often wonder, why is that? Because clearly, in the passport, it's Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time I, uh, you know, it... It leads me to the reason why you're on the streets of Ocho Rios. And a guy says, hey, foreigner, you're back. And I know in other countries, I was in Barbados recently. That does not happen. If you're born a Bayesian, you're always a Bayesian, regardless of which passport you carry. So I think that uh, this should never happen in Jamaica, that you're going to visit and you're in a lineup with hundreds of Canadians. And what really burns me up sometimes is that uh, I look around and I see a lot of Caribbean nationals who probably are visiting for the first time. And they get to go in the, uh, the Caribbean nationals lineup. And I'm there with a whole bunch of people who probably have been, you know, just going to Jamaica for the first time. It really burns me up. All right, let me ask you. I'll ask you this. Let's say the next time you go to Jamaica, the, the, the Caribbean Jamaica line, it has 400 people and the Canadian line has four. What line are you going to join? But, you know, that's a, a, a simple answer. 
but uh, I should be able to make that choice. No, but then it seems to me like what you're arguing is a matter of convenience then. It sounds like that's what you're arguing. Because if you truly feel No, I'm just arguing mm -hmm. that what is established in other countries. If you're no, but, a Jamaican, but you know, the, if, if you were born, uh, even in the Dominican Republic, if you were born in the Dominican Republic, you returned with a Canadian passport, hey, you're, you're a Dominican. Yeah, but here's the thing. You know, I, I, let, me, let me give you a simple suggestion. Do you have a Jamaican passport? No. All right. Get a Jamaican passport because guess what? If you were born in Jamaica, you're a Jamaican. Unless you you decided that you didn't want to become, you didn't want to remain a Jamaican, and then you went through the process of ridding yourself of Jamaican citizenship. So you're eligible to get a Jamaican passport. I would say to you, Jamaica recognizes dual citizenship with Canada. So you should travel with both passports, and then whichever line is shorter, then you join that line. Yeah. That's what you I, I I understand what you're but saying, you but I shouldn't have but, to but you are make that decision. Let me just make it, yeah, but let me make it. Well, that's why I'm saying get the Jamaican passport. Then you can decide which line you want to join because you can join you can join either the can either the foreigner line or you can join the Jamaica the Caricom line. So that's when you have the choice. But as long as you show up with a foreign passport, and a foreign passport is any passport that's not Jamaican. As long as you show up with a different passport than a Jamaican passport, they're gonna shunt you over to that line. So to avoid that, get a Jamaican passport. No, I. Uh, people have said that to me quite a bit, but the thing I've always wondered, and I ask this question quite seriously, when the Jamaican government refer that uh, to the diaspora, who did they, are they talking about then? Are they talking about Jamaicans as overseas who have Jamaican passports, or Jamaicans who, like myself, have uh, other countries' passports? No, they're. I mean, yeah. You know, let, let, let me simply answer that too. If, if, if I'll give you a simple answer to that. But they're, when they say diaspora, they're talking about somebody who has Jamaican citizenship, either to birth, marriage, or, or 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 affiliation, meaning that you you your grandparents, right, or your parents. As long as you can claim that Jamaican heritage, that Jamaican citizenship, as long as you can, then you're considered a member of the diaspora, of the Jamaican diaspora. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I get what you're saying. It's just that it does not follow the 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 the, the rules that other countries seem to be able to or, or seem to have in place. No. Whereas but I go back I... with wherever <laughs> you go back to with a passport, foreign or otherwise, you were born there. People welcome you as being from that country as opposed to being from the one that you have the, the the passport well i understand what you're saying but it just irks me every time it just bothers me right, so well, i i, I will not out. be getting a, a jamaican passport really Whoa. because <laughs> why you won't... hello yeah why won't you get a jamaican passport no, it's just that I, it's just a matter of principle for me. I don't okay. think I should have to get one to say I'm a Jamaican. You know, I don't think I should. It says in there, plainly, born in Jamaica. Shouldn't right. have to do Let that. Let me ask you a question. When you go to Jamaica, you talk like this or do you speak like that? Well, <laughs> I could go either way. I mean, then, it doesn't. But, you, yeah, because that's why they said to you, this is a foreigner's back. That's why, you know what I mean? Because if, if you're going to... No, 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 no. No, what I'm saying, that uh, the government legitimized people calling me foreigner. Oh, oh I Because see. when you oh, go oh, there, I'm in the foreigner line. I don't feel okay. as if I'm, I'm coming home. Okay, I see what yeah. you're saying. Hey, right. Right. Hey. Hold on. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, this is something that I think all it requires is an administrative uh, ruling, and they do it. But... You know, I, I just think, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, a lot of this uh, interaction with the diaspora is... Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell, just... you what. I'll tell you what, if you, if you brought up that point, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm certain that you're not the only one who uh, feels that way. So what I would suggest you do is this, and I'm serious about it, is if you, if you would send a letter to PICA or the Minister of National Security, and explain all of this and say, look, I was born in Jamaica, and therefore when I show up with a foreign passport and it says I was born in Jamaica, 
I should be afforded the courtesy of joining any line I want, whether it's a foreigner, uh, the line for foreigners or the line for Jamaica. And then, and I, I seriously mean it because I don't think you're the only person with, with, with you know, taking that position. Yeah. And let's see what they say. Let's see what they yeah. say to you. Because they may have a more comprehensive. All right. And a more, yeah, they may have a more comprehensive and detailed answer than the one I just provided you with. And I'd love to hear from you again. <laughs> Yeah, I enjoy your show. So keep uh, keep at it. Uh, I'm I'm getting a lot of information I certainly would not have gotten anywhere else. So that's good. why we're here. That's why we're here. We're at your service. All right. Take uh, care. Take care now. Bye bye. All right. I have to love you and leave you. <laughs> that's fine. You know. All right. Go. Don't leave it. Another call. Come on. This may be for you. <laughs> Paula, go ahead. Please. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah, are we online, Rati? Yes, yes. Tell me something. Um, that thing we're looking about the, you know, the, um, the diaspora thing. How far you reach today? I'm waiting for the IRS to come back and give me, um, give it uh, the, um, um, tax exempt uh, status. Okay. All because right. me, your man said something to you a while ago, and that's why me want you just go ahead with that thing. One hundred percent. He might go tell about the prime minister is a bad person. And the most wicked experiments that has ever born in right. Jamaica. All so right. That's what we call about. Yeah, forgot. call me back because oh, them just they just drop off the car. All right. Yeah, but no, you know, people have different opinions, and we have to be respectful of people's opinions. And as long as they don't get you know rude and nasty and discourteous, then then we're fine with it. Because here's how I look at it. I have an opinion. You have an opinion. No. I need to hear from you about your opinion because you may end up having me change my mind or like or, or vice versa. Or we may still hold fast to our positions once the conversation is open, but at least we get an exchange. You know what I mean? All right, he's gone. All right, Rosalia, look. Oh, yeah. He's back. She said, don't want to call her going dark. He's getting ready to leave us. Do you have a question for her? Uh huh. Yeah, you do. Go no, ahead, the, thing, the thing about it, I kind of respect how Rosalie talking and thing. Is about one thing when I ask her the question to tell me what was the, who the um who she can point out to be a, in the party. She yeah. kind of walk around it. All right. That's what I did. Like she kind of uh, walk okay, around. And, it. and let me tell you because I think that here's what I was trying to establish a principle that there are well, one second, Rosalie. One second. One second. Call her after let you go now. But Rosalie's gonna provide you with the answer. All right. Yeah. Okay, we talk next week. All right. All right. Caller, you there? Yeah, thank you. All right, hold on one second, please. Rosalie is going to provide yeah, I, to the Yeah, I just wanted to say quickly, that there are people in the political parties, both of them, members of parliament, that most of us don't know. We just don't know who they are. We They're, they're not ministers. They're not talking. Many of them are first-time politicians, and I don't assume... That they're bad people. That's the point I'm making. Right. That we have to assume that there are some good people who are trying to do things. And I don't mean, remember the people in government is exactly a replica of Jamaicans. They are not people from outer space. Jamaicans right. are full of criminals, bad people, good people, and not so good people. That's who we are. Right. And I assume right. that's the same for Parliament. All right, Carla, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rosalie is getting ready to leave, so I hope you have a question for her and not for us, because we're going to stick around well, a bit longer. Well, I want her to, to opine on what I'm about to say. Okay, so, go ahead, please. Uh, so, right, so there's a, there's a caller that uh, just said that Andrew Holness is a good man. First, Andrew Holness is not a good person, and there are a number of reasons for that. First, first for example, and this is most recent, he feels like he's um, entitled to um, a salary increase of over 200%, while there are people who are still making... Thirteen thousand dollars for minimum wage per week, and there are people that are that are not even working and have probably have no way of making a living. But right. it, what what piqued my interest here? The gentleman said that Andrew Holness' colleagues have secrets for him. What type of secrets are those? Are they crimes against the country? What type of secret? I mean, look, if he laid his bed hard, he should sleep in it. And if he's a good man, then no one should have any secrets for him. That's probably uh, you know crime crimes against the country. Sorry. What more does he want the diaspora to do for Jamaica, even though we're doing a lot? What more? We're sending upwards of $4 billion there, foreign exchange, value of foreign exchange, right? Uh, we are also sending 
uh, monies that the, uh, the, 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 the remittance system doesn't capture. We're sending appliances, we're sending electronics. There are people who are even sending stuff to Jamaica to help Jamaica, and they get catching hell at the airport as far as customs and clearance and all that type of stuff. Like you said, Chang, Chang just wants our money, okay? And, and we should just go disappear. He just wants our money, and we should just go away. The other thing with Andrew Holness that I would like to say is, I don't know, but he, he has displayed uh, uh, his, his, his actions are consistent with someone that has multiple personality disorder. Meaning that, and I'm not saying he has it, he'll say one thing today, and then the next day he says the opposite stuff. And I'm wondering if he has multiple personality disorder where once one angel holiness doesn't know what the other angel holiness is doing. Right. How could he just contrast himself like that and get away with it? I think today that's okay. he says, I'm sorry. No, I think that's a valid point you make, but I just want to, Rosalie is getting ready to leave. So I'm just asking if you have a question for her, can you just shoot it at her? Because Herb and I will be around, so we, you can talk to us after, but she's getting ready to leave. Well, no, I, I no, I just thank you guys for coming on and and, 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 and giving her opinions on stuff. And, and I appreciate it. She, she, she came off as really genuine, honest person. And, and thank you, Rosalie. Thank you so it. much. And I just want to add to co comment to you that one of the things the diaspora people can do, people in diaspora, is basically to demand that the prime minister, um, you know, ensure that he gets the integrity commission approval with respect to his um declarations as soon as possible i mean you know that's something right. that can be done and insisted upon because that's the law all right well look folks we have to leave it there with rosalia because she has to attend to other business and we're so grateful that she was able to spend a considerable amount of time with us on a saturday afternoon when she you know she has other commitments so we want to thank her and as always we tell her this is home for her she doesn't need an invitation. She can just stop by whenever and just tell us what's on her mind and we can have a discussion or discussions like the one we had today. So, Rosalia, thank you very much. Is there anything you want to say before you leave us? Well, just to say... Yeah, I want to say this to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought you were referring to me. Go ahead. No, no, no. He was talking to us. Go ahead, Rosalia. Oh, okay. No, I'm just going to thank you. Thank you in particular for, you know, the hosting, creating this platform so that we can have this dialogue. Um, thank, of course, Herb for his ongoing work. And to all your listeners and people who have joined us online that, you know, Jamaica will be better. Uh, I am optimistic about this and it will be better because of us because of our advocacy, because of our honesty, because of our genuine capacity and willingness to make a difference in Jamaica. So I want to just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Good to see you again. One soon. love. One love, yes. All right. Good. All right. All right. So, so. Yeah, uh, Carla, yeah, uh, man, somebody's trying to get in here, but go ahead. Um, you have something for me and her? No, what I, I mean, if you could have a program one of these weeks on the, his declaration since she brought it up, because I mean, at first, I think he had a, a 525, uh, uh, 100, uh, 100,000 US stuff, and then his, 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 his um, I think his liability at some point uh, became like 170. So we'd like to know what happened. Uh, uh, with the difference of 355. How was he able to pay off 355 in such a short period of time oh, when he was making no more than my 9 million uh, Jamaican dollars? So maybe it's something that he could look into. Right. But also look into what his wife is doing with respect to the uh, the land that he's, she's having problems the with. Thank you. going to take care of all of that, all right? Thanks, appreciate all it, right. man. Take care, no Great problem. program. All Bye. Right, thanks. Carla, sorry to keep you waiting. Go ahead, please. Good evening. Good evening. And I thank you guys for the massive work that you're doing. And I wonder what would Jamaica be if you guys were not doing this fight for us? Um, my input is that, and being a, um, a retired teacher, yes. what I would like to see a good, strong program, because I have been involved in many um, projects in the Department of Health in New York. I have been a dean, I've been um, the um, special ed coordinator, along with many other things, a math teacher. And I am um, doing my transition 
to Jamaica. And I feel like I am coming in loaded, but nowhere to unload. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one who wants to go back and give up ourselves to Jamaica. Right. And as the caller spoke about the, the um, taking one of those um, corner middle six, sorry, that, that to me is is really out there. But if we could take or be partnership with the Department of Education and bring back home teachers or encourage teachers, even those of us who have retired, we might be retired, but we're not finished. Right, right, I agree. To help to build back Jamaica. For example, I would like to even motivate teachers as I have done in the New York school um, system. And I feel like I am loaded, I'm full, but nowhere to unload. Or where do I unload? Right. And I don't want it to be political. Okay. All right. That's a good point. All right. Well, look, thanks for the call. Stay in touch. All right. Okay. All right. Now, be well. Um, somebody just asked about the name of the movement. Uh, well, it's the, it's the One Jamaica Legal Defense Foundation. And as soon as we get the status, folks, I promise you, you'll be the first to know. All right? So just, well, actually, I was going to say bear with us, but actually we're waiting on the IRS to come back uh, with that, with the grant of that status. And once that's done, then we're we're almost in business. We just need to open up the website, open up the bank account, and then we just move forward. Um, hold on a second. Yes, Carla, go ahead. Welcome. Hi, how are you doing? I just have a quick question. I wanted to ask your opinion. This is regarding the uh, company that the government used to give themselves the pay raise, the formula that, that they use. I wanted to know why would a Jamaican government uh, outsource like an internal audit to a foreign company? Because if you think about it, um, I'm sure there are intelligent Jamaicans or accountants that could, you know, look at the books, you know, and it's not that I mean to oversimplify, um, um, under or oversimplified, but think about the millions that was paid to this foreign company. It could have been paid to a Jamaican who could have, you know, balanced the book and then see, you know, what future recommendations they could make, you know, just like how an economist would do. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering maybe one of the reasons why they won't reveal um, the, the information to the Greener that requested it. Could it be that they were probably like cooking the books, you know, probably because of mismanagement and it's a deficit instead of a profit, because if it's a profit, then everybody would benefit. I'm just wanting to know what your uh, thoughts are on that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks again. Um, regarding that issue, the, the basis for the pay hike and that the fact that, uh, that, that it wasn't done by a Jamaican company, even though we have highly qualified people who could have done it. And the second part is that it's 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 secret so far. We we can't get access. People have been asking to get access to this report, and they have not been given access to the report. Um, I agree with the caller. I I don't know why it was done that way, um, and I don't know how things are going to turn out. All I can say is that we're going to keep trying to get that report. Uh, I've seen I've seen some reporting that maybe there was a kickback. I don't know how true that is, but. Uh, it's just kind of suspicious that you would pay, you know, as much money as the Jamaican government did to justify the pay increase. And then you say, when people say, okay, we want to see the report that you use to justify the pay increase. You say, oh, no, 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 we, you know, we can't give it to you. That makes no sense because that should belong to the Jamaican people. So that's a fight that that's going to continue. And hopefully uh, we will get that information soon. Uh, right, they, Herb, yeah. right, I, I would say also that maybe it's the same company that the prime minister is agreeing with when he says we weren't really doing any work before. But now that we're getting this pay raise, we can start working. Isn't that, in essence, what he was saying? Yes. And like Rosalie was saying, it just doesn't make any sense, you know. Yeah. Um, Somebody, somebody just asked in the chat room about saying that if you get the 
declaration and what do you do i unfortunately i didn't see the whole the whole uh, uh string of uh, text messages to understand what the person was asking but if the person is asking about the lawsuit against Kamina johnson smith um you have to realize that a declaration can be used in many different ways um it's just another way to skin the cat uh, and that's what we that's what we intend to do we can't tell you what we intend to do with it specifically but just know that it's not something it's not a decision that we're going to frame and put on a wall um that's not our intention but uh stay tuned uh because the fight is just beginning and we love these kinds of fights well the, the fight for the soul of the jamaican people the fight for poor people we love that we'll take those fights on any day of the week and twice on sundays so just stay tuned um, I know you're anxious to see what we're going to be doing with a declaration, and I'm surprised a lot of people didn't ask that question before. Maybe they thought about it, but they didn't ask. But uh, stay tuned. Herb. Yeah, I, um, I a lot of interesting comments here in 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 in, in the uh, chat room, and one of the things our people are very outspoken, but I think it's time now that they start giving us. Um, like you asked, that fell off a blueprint. Give us some constructive uh, criticism, not just name calling, but say what you want to see and why you want to see it and how you would go about doing it. You know, if you if you take the time to write, um, put put some more meat on the bones, and say right. Bones, uh, we we really would appreciate that. But you know, I this this prime minister, no matter how much criticism he gets, he does not care. And to go outside of the country and find a company that's willing to write up um, not just uh, some kind of bogus um, uh, thing to give yourself two hundred and fourteen percent pay raise, but pretty much to make make it your look look um, as if you're working so hard and you've been underpaid for so long that you really and truly need this money. And I, and I just don't see that. Um, I think they can do uh, more work uh, in their constituencies with, with, with uh, less time in parliament, especially seeing that they're not mandatory attend in attendance in parliament. Right, they should be monitoring in, in attendance, and maybe we can start out. Just let them work in Parliament for um, a month out of each quarter. That's four months out of the year, and and pay them for that. You know, you don't need to be paying them all this money because they really and truly are not accomplishing anything. If they're not passing laws, if they're not improving the 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 um, the homestead of those people in Jamaica, right? They're certainly not doing anything for the diaspora. But the bottom line is they need to do something for the citizens of Jamaica. And that's not mm -hmm. happening. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's if 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 Jamaica was highly successful and, and the living conditions were fantastic and the people of Jamaica didn't have to worry about sleeping with the, the doors um, uh, open, right? As he said, he, he would have them do. Well, I would I'd be, have a lot of self-praise for the government. Right, but, right. but the fact is, they can't sleep with the doors open. They can't sleep with the windows yeah. open. And they're without not. AC and a, a ceiling fan, you can imagine people inside the house are burn up, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just put inside the chat, I think it's Andrea, said that um, uh, uh, oh, somebody said, them know me now, go for him, they are the order. And, and you're right. <laughs> we have we have some plans for that order. All right. Um, uh, somebody, I think it's Andrea just said that uh, we have to be careful with uh, the prime minister because he thinks five steps ahead. Well, we don't have to think alongside him. All we need to do is just monitor his steps. That's all we're yeah. doing. Because, and we're not the only ones monitoring his steps. There are other people monitoring his steps. And there are other people who have monitored his steps. So, and we're creatures of habit. So they know exactly where he's going. So 
you know, I, I'll give an example, Andrea. I used to, one of my job, one of my first jobs in the FBI was to follow spies, right? And they would take us on these journeys, you know what I mean? I mean, it was an amazing learning experience. It's, it's some of the things that you see on TV, and it's a lot more than that. But after a while, we knew exactly where they were going to go. We knew because people are creatures of habit, right? So he can think about his five steps and his 10 steps. He's a creature of habit. And all you have to do, if you monitor somebody long enough, you'll know when, they, when, they, when, they, when they're getting ready to make that next five step move, you'll know exactly where they're going. And you're also talking to people who have been trained to do this kind of thing. So it's not like, you know, um, somebody on the street who, who doesn't have this kind of training. And so you're asking them to, to see where the next five steps predict or follow the next five steps. It's a little bit different for us. Herb and I, we've been involved in the intelligence business for many, many years, for decades. And so we have a we have a skill set that the prime minister doesn't have. He's going to have to learn how to avoid being monitored. And when I say monitored, I'm not talking about electronic or anything like that. Just the way he thinks and what he's doing. So, and at some point, you're gonna pretty much just the way that uh, the minister, Minister Kamina Johnson Smith, right now where she is, she's gonna she made she made her five steps, and now she's in a corner. She's in the corner. She can't come out of this corner. Cannot. Because she's made it clear that she didn't get a gift and she received no benefits, even though it's the, the, the everything else you look at says the opposite. So somebody said, I'm trained by God, bro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let me see. Jamaican paid one million to tell them to give themselves a pay raise. Oh, yeah, Tony Barrett. That's a good point. Yeah. The Jamaican government paid $1 billion to tell them to give themselves a pay raise. That's essentially what it boils down to. And then at the same time, who's make, who's paying for the pay raise? The Jamaican population. And they can see the justification for these men and women getting that raise. It's nonsense. Nonsense. So um, and, uh, we, we're going to wrap up in like another 20 minutes or so. Or maybe before that, if we don't get any calls. So... Or any, any anything that you guys want to discuss because remember this program is for you right we're just here to provide the guidance and the information but it's for you um, and a lot of you have said you have learned a lot more than you normally would by just listening to the program and that's a, a high compliment for us um and we take it seriously uh, so we don't want to waste your time when we come on we want to be able to give you something that you can sink your teeth in so, so Rati, let me ask you, what stood out for you this week? And you, oh. you heard, you know, tell the people what stood out that day. Right, yeah. You, you, you were right. over at the U.S. Senate, and you were also over at the Rayburn Building in the House of Representatives here in the U.S. And, and right. the other the question first... I wanted to ask you, can Canadian or British citizens make a contribution and can the the US um nonprofit go towards right. getting them tax breaks also? Yes, once we do the the, the tax exempt status, anybody can 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 okay. make their car. Right. Caller, go ahead, please. Hello. Hello? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Um yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, me just, um, me, a pocket you know, call. Call you, Hello? No, I'm asking if it's a pocket dial. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you intend to call us back? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to understand, right, where I'm coming from, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, If this prime minister, right? Yes. If someone... If someone in his in his in his government, if someone there is honest and honest, they're gonna get up and say, "Look, sir, I don't believe that is good for the country." They're gonna talk to the mother, the mother if they don't even have a ministry, right? They're gonna speak the truth. So if you if you accept what the prime minister is doing, the mother if they don't even have a ministry, yeah. You, Hello? Get cut off. Uh, let me see. Call must have dropped. 
the car yeah he's still on okay he's in a bad spot then yeah he's in a dead zone caller caller if you can hear us we can't hear you um so call us back please yeah um the first day it was uh by zoom it was virtual uh -huh. and we we talked about um just some justice matters uh yeah justice matters i have my notes over here but i don't even want to go through them but the second day we talked about crime and security resolving key issues in the caribbean and the third day political instability this must be hello caller you're live on reason with ratigan go ahead please uh mr ratigan good evening to your panels and the guests Yes, sir. No, sir. I tried to call you some time ago. I want to speak to another subject. Now, the FBI, I'm um, sorry, the, what do you call it? The FLA. Matters with the FLA. Oh, I noticed the FLA treats Jamaicans living over is like second class citizens. Now, did you know, sir, that if you were Jamaican living overseas, you're not allowed to have a firearm? Yes, I'm aware of that. If you don't have a. If you're not a Jamaican resident, yeah, if you live here. No, right? even if you're a Jamaican resident, I live with Jamaican citizenship, living overseas, you're not allowed to fire arm. And I think that's the biggest, that's the craziest thing. And you're not told that. I have friends who applied, and five years they're waiting for, um, for uh, to hear their appeal. You know, right. why if it, it take somebody five years to hear your appeal? A friend told me that. He has to, they told him that, um, what do you call it now, two years have been added because of the COVID. Two years have been added to his, to the time for appeal. Yes. And that, that is crazy. I think you have some coffee drinkers up there, policy makers go in there, and they make the laws to suit them and not considering the wider community. And I think that's a black eye for that um, organization. Right. And somehow there, there gotta be some changes. Your family is living overseas, come to Jamaica, and they want to go and be, to enjoy themselves. They should be able to go to their family, pick up their firearm, and be like an ordinary citizen. But no, they, they're, they're covered and they can't go out because they have the fear of being robbed or certain things. And I think the FLA should look into this and right. make sure that sit, have the right. No. Regardless where you live, you're a Jamaican and you want to come to Jamaica, you should. Yeah. Then these people I'm talking about have homes in Jamaica. Right. Not that they live overseas and they come home. They have homes in Jamaica. Right. And I think that's a bad, bad, bad situation that needs to be corrected. All right. I'll tell you, you know, I, I didn't provide an answer to you, but let me just take this other call. Stand by for the answer, all right? All right. Thanks. All right. Yes, caller. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I call him. Yeah, because see, I call him. Yeah. What I was saying. But all right. Hold on. Before you start, let me just say to the last caller regarding FLA that what I would suggest is to reach out to to them i mean I, I i've reached out to them through through other means but they have a policy regarding um the people residing overseas um their eligibility for a firearm in jamaica and they should get that there's a policy there and they should take a look at that policy now if you want the policy to be changed that's something different but i do believe that they have a policy concerning the eligibility of people living overseas to own a firearm in Jamaica, and if you recall, there was a huge scandal not too long ago where there have there were people who um, at least there's one case I can remember where the man was in prison in America, and he had a he had a permit for a firearm in Jamaica, and it was being even though he couldn't leave prison to go get it uh, a, a license or re licensed or whatever, it was being done every every time that it it had to be recertified, re licensed, whatever. It was being done, yet he was still in prison here. So there's a huge scandal. But I would suggest you reach out to them regarding the policy. And if you are dissatisfied with what's going on or how the policy is structured, then please give me a call and then we can we can we can talk about steps forward because I'm all about doing that, making taking steps forward to make things better. Um the, the question as to whether or not you should even have a firearm if you don't live in Jamaica, that's something else. But let's try and look at the policy first and then go from there. Caller, go ahead, sir. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know that, right? If, as I was saying, if someone is there that is very honest, if that person does the evil ministry, 
is a backbencher and the premise say something that is dishonest, that's the not true. If that person is a honest person, that person gonna get up and say, Sir, you know, you made the premise of the leader of the party, but no, this is not right. We have to be truthful to the people of Jamaica, right? right? Because it's the people who put us here. So we have to be truthful. So as long as they don't say anything, they are they are accepting what the prime minister is doing. So I, that's why I said I do not see no one there that is honest, well, right? Let, or even a good politician. Well, let me let me throw this out to you. Mm -hmm. we, we do we know what people have said to him privately? Maybe they don't say to him publicly for for a variety of reasons, including embarrassing well, you know, the leader. But we don't know what's being said to him behind closed doors. Maybe they have some people who have approached him and said, "Listen, this we need we need to have a we need to have a course correction." And and he said, uh, "No, we don't know that." But what we do know is that people aren't coming out and publicly chastising him or publicly explaining to him the errors of his way. And there may be reasons for that, like um, like as uh, uh, they call it, blowback, you know. Um, people just don't want, and, and, and people may be fearful of uh, losing their political careers. We don't know, but we can't assume that people haven't spoken to him. We can say that we haven't heard them speak to him publicly, people within his party, but maybe they've spoken to him behind closed doors. Well, as you say, maybe. Right. Maybe. Right. Maybe. Right. But you know, when I, when I see he got up in the parliament the other day and he was talking, just like a bully, like a dictator, cause he he remind me of Trump, right? He that's the way he stand up and he was going on. A prime minister don't be that. And if, when I look, everyone was clapping their hand like they agree. Not one hold on their hand and didn't say nothing. Then you could say, oh, that person not clapping. You could say, well, that person doesn't agree with the way he's behaving, right? Mm. So actions speak louder than words. And the good word said, by the fruit, you shall know, know them. them. Right. 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 That's what right. the good word said. By the right, fruit, you shall know them. So that's why I that's why I, I say that. I say that. I don't say no one. I look at even Mark Bowling. Right? There are people within the party that criticize them publicly. Then Mark Bowling have, have to say that if you have a dispute with me, make could have a whole stock. No, just go up on the year and talk about it. Okay. Right? They criticize him publicly. All right. So the premise is not different. Well, that's what I'm saying. Leadership that, style, my brother. That's right. That's right. That's right. In a sense. Hello. 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 Mm -hmm. Hello. This is, this is this is for you and and Mr. Herb Nelson. The the crime is so rampant. In Jamaica, no criminal organization cannot survive without the help of the police. What do you think the government should do towards it? What is it, what is your comment? Okay, um, let me take this other column. We're going to answer you. Hold on, stand by for your answer. Right, go ahead, please. Exaltation, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Likewise. Um, regarding the ramifications of a statement the Minister of National Security made recently, I'm still harping on this because um, I think it's crazy for the leader of security to come out and say what you said in regards to how police in his jurisdiction, it being Jamaica, should act mm -hmm. when, dealing with, when they find people with firearms in Jamaica. And he said, shoot to kill, don't waste resources in the hospital. Right, right, right. Question in regards um, is in regards to how can we legally get to him based on the statements that you have made? Say somebody, um, a police officer shoots somebody and they want the, the family want um, civil suits. Can we approach it in that way? And yeah. will your will your and, and will your fund this organization be in the capacity to assist with a family who wants that? Yeah, That's as it. long as it has to do with the government, if it's if it's if it's between two private citizens, no, we won't get involved. But as long as it has to do with the government, yes, we will. Um, so that's where we are with that. That's a simple yes. answer to that. But let me run and grab this other call. All right. No problem. All right. 
Yes, Carla, go ahead, please. Hi, hi Rati. Good evening. Good Question. Evening. Yes, ma'am. Can, can someone request the information from Ernst and Young from here? Um, uh, yes, and I'll tell you how. Through the um, FARA, Foreign Agents Registration Act, they would be able to see that, whatever that report, they would be able to see something reflecting the report. Maybe not the report itself, but something showing that uh, an American company was engaged with a uh, foreign government. That certainly would be in the domain of the Foreign Agent Reporting Act, uh, that statute. So you can actually go to the website on the, uh, uh, the Department of Justice. Go to the uh, go to the Department of Justice website and look for FARA, F-A-R-A, Foreign Agents mm -hmm. Registration Act. And I just did it last week. I, I I don't remember the exact route I took, but it's 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 through the Department of Justice. And then they'll mm -hmm. give you a list. You put the company in, and you give a, like a date when you think mm -hmm. that the document was filed, and it'll give you everything. Okay, but like you said, it won't give us the actual um, wording of it, the document. It, 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 it may or may not because because it's a work product. It may not be there because what what's required of them is that they just file this form and file mm -hmm. the contract. So you probably will be more than likely you'll see the contract and you'll see the filing made by made by um, the, uh, the the firm. But I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you'll see the document itself. Yeah, because the whole idea is to try and um, get a preview of the, the document. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll be working on it. So call me back next week and um, uh, hopefully I'll have an answer for you regarding that. We we will talk um, via the when, um, the man in the wilderness. Ah, no problem. <laughs> All right. Yeah, man. All okay. right. I heard. All right. All right. Bye. How are you doing? Yes, caller. Go ahead, please. Mr. Rodrigan. Yes, sir. Uh, Lowell Smith, New York. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I just wish to say something very briefly to you and your panel. I, I, I really welcome your program. I've listened in quite a few times. And I just want to say a few things that, uh, you know, uh, by listening to you all, and I really respect what you all are trying to do. I really feel very, very badly about what's happening in Jamaica. I just came back. The highways are great, but the local roads, what most people utilize, is in the, is, it's in the worst shape it has ever been. But picture this. 83 years ago, you can imagine how old I am. 83 years ago, I used to carry water from about less than a quarter mile from a standpipe. Okay. Two, year, two years now, there's no water in that area. Place that, place that Eddie Siago was living for quite some time. I won't even go much deeper than that. When you see the roads into Ocho Rios, almost in the town, because tourists are not using that main thoroughfare again through uh, Fern Gully. You can't believe it. Almost to the center of town. And I could go on and on. I don't want to take up much of your time. And I didn't believe I would ever call uh, this type of uh, show to really discuss this. But I tell you, it, it, it pains your heart when you see what has been done in Jamaica. So the rich and famous, of course, who's living there and enjoying the life there is very good. But the people are really, really suffering. I'm not trying to make up a story. I'm right. telling you like it is. Right. Here's someone who has lived in, I mean, different parts of the world and so on. And really, you love your country. I listen to you and Herb and many others. And believe me, there's maybe a little hope, yes. I hope the new generation, the young generation, will be able to do something. I don't think presently any of the present people are going to do the only thing to help Jamaica to really be better. It's sad to say this. I know you're making a, a tremendous effort. I remember years ago, Pat Savinsky was part of the New York base area here. We we raised a lot of stuff for Najasa, if you ever heard of that name. But that's in the 80s. And send stuff to all the hospitals and other places. I personally per helped to pursue that. That was in the 80s. Okay. And I tell you, it's it's the effort by Jamaicans overseas have been tremendous all these years. But I can't tell you because I'm not versed in law or how government should be run. But I tell you this, it will take a miracle to really turn things around. I hope you and your panel there and many other people I know are really making the effort 
have the form for that panel for, for, for that miracle. And that's right. it. Thank you so much. I wish to speak with you personally off the air another time. I don't know when is the best time to call. I, I will try to reach you. I, I don't I'm not really comfortable speaking with you on the air, but after the I, program. After we terminate the program. Oh, I would like to speak with you, Professor, sir. Right. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Right. Caller, go ahead, please. Hello? Okay. Yeah, Herb. Um, oh, yeah, some, somebody put in the chat about um, my affiliation, or I think it's wishful thinking, my affiliation with uh, the UIC. It's, UIC. Yeah, they keep harping on it. Harping, you know? It's which because hold on one second. Yes, caller, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Matthew. Yes, yeah. good evening. Yeah, I want to I want to say something about something I noticed in the parliament that has made me quite kind of uncomfortable. Okay. The new senator up up fits ending. Yes. In presentation, what the call is made in presentation. He said something about the integrity commission. Yes. He was basically saying that what he was saying is that there's somebody in the integrity commission who's not even a qualified criminal lawyer trying to budge up the, uh, I guess he was talking about the director of corruption and prostitution, about prosecuting somebody. So basically what he's saying that somebody who doesn't know the law as well is trying to get somebody else who knows the law to do something that they shouldn't do. And I am concerned about this because as far as I know, the integrity commission stuff is supposed to be secret. How would he know if somebody's pressuring somebody else about something? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point to raise. It's political fostering. You know I mean? People get up there in parliament and they just say whatever they feel like saying. Um, they're not worried about being uh, sued or anything like that. Uh, and, and you have to keep in mind also that the, 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 the Integrity Commission put the government in a very, very distasteful spot the other day when they tried to bring charges against the prime minister so now what we're seeing is retaliation uh, and I, yeah. I i think that that that's the case they're just retaliating against him and now they're trying to defang them they're trying to take away take away the powers that they gave them back in 20 was it 2018 with well, 2017 but the, the organization actually right. started working in 2018. Yeah. So, what, 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 what i think i'm with this government i'm more and more sure enough is that they inherited this thing and they didn't read it through properly and they just passed it to say, Yeah, we did it. And no, they're in problem because they didn't even understand what they passed. Because they don't they, they weren't the one who dropped up the thing, they inherited it. Right, right. Uh, and uh, and they just pass it. And a lot of things is happening like that. That they that they, they think that they're smart and running with it without going through carefully and looking at it, and it's coming back to bite them. Right. I, yeah, I want to say uh, oh go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. I want to say one thing. You had asked me a question on loan something one time when I was calling about where the CC and the SAR goes. And it's the Department of Justice Financial Crime Enforcement Network. That 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 is where it goes. Because you had asked me about where where the, the, the SAR. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember the SAR, report. yeah, the suspicious activity. Right, report. and, and yeah. the CTR. That, that's where they go. I didn't want to say it at the time because I was sure I know we used to send something to JFK. But yeah. no, I think that that was where, like. Where does it go again? Give me that information, please. Financial Crime Enforcement Network. That's in the Department of Justice. It's uh, FinCEN. Is that what FinCEN. you're talking about? Right. Yeah. 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 Right. That's 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 what we used to send them. And I also looked into the thing because you had mentioned that that like it was all one thing. So I looked into the issue because I I I I, I was here in the site. I came. I inherited where when it was in progress. So initially, as you said, it was it was uh, it was well. The first one was the teller would report the ten thousand if it was suspicious. If the teller think it was suspicious, right. I think it was a privacy thing where the teller couldn't just report everything. So the initial one that was started in the eighties was like that. So if the teller think something is suspicious, they would have to they would have to report it. Right. Then they changed that and the privacy notice to allow for all transactions to re be reported. Right. So they would report all, so they could track all of them. And then if teller think it was suspicious, there was a, a, a box, a check box on it that they would check. So they said, this is, so you report all, but you check it if you think it's suspicious. Right. And let me, and just, then, what, no, let me yeah. just say to the audience that um, what we're talking about is uh, 
is when you deposit more than ten thousand dollars. Well, not just deposit, deposit and withdraw. Oh, withdraw. Only ten thousand dollars. More than ten thousand dollars, right? It right. Will trigger, okay. it will trigger reporting uh, meca uh, mechanism. Right. right. In a day, ten thousand, ten thousand dollars in cash in a day. And, and, we, and we also need to let them know that if you do nine thousand and you do it too often, then that triggers structuring. Which well, actually, right. act actually, 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 could be such so such so suspicious if you do nine thousand even one time. Because if, if at any point in time the, the teller thinks that they're doing it, uh, well, the teller and the manager, because somebody has to sign it other than the teller, depending on the level of the teller. Mm -hmm. But if they think if they think if they think you're doing it, it could be a suspicious, it could okay. be a suspicious activity. So it's, it's it's not that. And one of the things I was saying when I was on lonesome is that people people need to understand that nobody thinks you're a criminal because you have ten thousand dollars in cash. People have legitimate reasons to do it. They just want to track all of them. So every one okay. of them, well, well, I have business, I remember I have businesses who take hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. We have their CTR on the system. When they come and just put in the amount of money, we sign it and we send it in. It's just like a routine thing. Okay. Because they have so much cash, we know. It's just that what you're doing needs to make sense for who you are. All right. It need, need to, so you, you could, like for example, somebody, I mean, we had a situation where people are going to Jamaica to build us and they try to take out a lot of cash. And we said, well, it, does it make sense to carry so much cash that you put yourself at risk? Right. The betterness of where we know the businessmen wanted that. I said, but how much do you need now? And what they do in that case is wire most of the money so it's there when they get there and take the cash that they need to start the project in order to do it. So, I mean, they don't have to, if you have a legitimate reason to use cash, do it. It's just that most of the time, most of the time people doing something in our cash is trying to avoid something. Okay. But it doesn't matter. We have nurses who come. And they take the cash because they're going to bury the family or whatever, and they don't want to. They don't want to go down there and deal with banks because sometimes the bank in Jamaica is horrible. Man. When when it comes to getting a point of from, they can be horrible, and some people just don't want to deal with it. And then also that triggers a reporting requirement when you're leaving the country with that much with, with that much money at the airport. Yeah, right. And that's the and that's the other point where people get get themselves into problem because it's the same thing again. It's not that you can't travel with the money; it's just that it needs to be reported. Yeah, you need to if you have a legitimate reason to do it, just report it. Don't try to avoid it because that's when you get yourself in problem. No people are going to start look at everything you do. Right. Because right. nobody sends. There are people who have legitimate reasons to use a lot of cash. They just want to know that it makes sense. So if, for example, like in Jamaica, we know, like, as I said, with the banks, you wire your money down there and you go down there and they're telling you this and that and you have to carry this and that. Some people don't want to deal with it. You rather deal with the cash. Just state that on your form. Okay. Just stay that on your farm, and if you have legitimate business to do, you do it. They're not saying that you cannot use money to use cash. They're just saying, give us the reason and let us see if it makes sense for who you are and the position you're in. Right. Hey, look, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Uh, invaluable information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All no right. problem. Take care of yourself. Right. Have cool. a good evening. Let me just, um, hold on one second. Yes, caller, go ahead, please. You're live with Reason for Take care uh, good afternoon, Mr. Radisson. I, I was listening to your program and I was wondering, as as a Jamaican overseas, if we can help the um, uh, Jamaicans at home with this whole uh, hydro or JPS business, because I was just thinking to myself, if someone steals lights, right, our power, uh, why should um, another person pay for it? If it is something we could challenge in the court, like take it up to the Supreme Court if it's necessary, just to help people in that sense to recover some of their money right and and that's something that i think is substantial if we could challenge that in court no one should force you to pay for something you didn't steal right well i just want to hear your thoughts on that i heard you want to take that but before you do her call her you can hang up and and her herb and i will, will address that all right um before you do that there, there's a question there's a question pending about uh, what we should do uh the government should be what what should the government do regarding uh, police corruption, uh, corruption within the police, because you're saying that that's one of the reasons for crime. Well, he, here's my answer to that. What the government should do is simply enforce the laws. They don't need to pass new laws. They already have the laws governing public corruption. They do, but they're not enforcing the laws. And so that's a question that has to be raised at the highest levels of the police. Now, what they'll tell you is that they have a, they have a division that does internal investigations and audits and so on and they do it but if they do they're not doing 
as far as the public perception is concerned, they're not doing a good job. Because like you said, we still see evidence of, uh, of public corruption committed by the police um, on a regular basis. So we need to address that. But again, it's a very simple answer. We have the laws already. The laws are on the books. All they have to do is just make a concerted effort to, to, to deal with this. And what that means is you may have to get rid of everybody that's there because, you know, uh, some people have made the argument that they're tainted as well. That's why you don't get people, uh, you don't get a lot of policemen, especially at a certain level, a certain rank, uh, being arrested, even though there's evidence or there is a perception um, or there's the allegation that they're involved in wrongdoing. But in a short, uh, in a brief way to answer your, your, your question, enforce the laws that are on the books. Go ahead, Herb. Yeah, the problem is there's a client-patron system amongst the politician and the police, right? Where the police know how to cover certain politicians. And the, 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 the relationship probably go back years and they cover for each other. They have each other's secrets. So the bottom line is you're not going to get the police uh, tattle tailing pretty much on their politi politician friends or vice versa because they've cover been covering each other's backsides for so long. Right? Right. It's just a matter of, of um, survival in their in their situations. All right. Hold on one second. Her caller. Uh, go ahead, please. Hi, missed you last night on Andre. Don't know why you weren't on there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> no, so, I, just to answer your question quickly. No, I had a, a legal matter to take care of um, um, a, a far distance from where I reside. And so I, it was imperative for me to be there. And I, I offered my apologies to him uh, in the middle of the week um, to let him know that I wouldn't be there. But I'll be there next Friday. Okay, make sure because you know we need you at least once a week. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Can I get enough, Freddie? <laughs> I'm a nurse, but I I want to say something that there is no way that we're ever gonna fix this whole police stuff in Jamaica unless we're able to go ahead. If the head is bad, how can you expect the tail to be? You, you can't expect the bad head to cut off the tail. That's bad. So right. it's a whole we need. It's a whole thing that we have to do a whole sweep. And just like when I go to Jamaica, I grew up in Jamaica. My dad did business in Jamaica growing up. And so I, I know a lot of the police, a lot of the, the banking people and stuff like that. And you know how simple thing is when you go in the bank, they know you. So they're like, oh, come to the... I said, no, 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 I'll wait in the line. All of us need to, although that's nothing big, but this is even part of the little corruption. Like we need to say, let's wait our turn, not jump the front of the line because Dick, Tom and Harry and Joan know us. So we're going to go to the front of the line. As little as you think that is, that is part of the fundamental corruption that have permeated every part of society in Jamaica. And the corruption is, we know corruption. Jamaicans are known to always, like they say that if you're going to hell and you see a Jamaican down there, don't worry because you're going to get out because we're going to find a way how to get out of hell. So it's just those little things. Like people need to be cognitive of that and decide that, you know what, don't matter how small it is, I don't want it. Right. And until we can all recognize that, then and, and change the mindset and change the whole society, we will never get rid of all the corruption in the society. I agree. So I that, agree. that that's what I had to say about that. So right. we we can't we can't keep on harping on oh the police corrupt. Yeah, the police corrupt, but so are we because when we go into places and Joan know us, we're gonna jump the front of the line. That's a corruption. That's, and people are like, oh, they never, they don't think about it. It's corruption. Not so only that, caller, but people, people are paying. Society, we're all a corrupt. We are a very corrupt society. Yeah, people pay extra money for privileges. Also, that's the problem, right? What did they, you say? They, people are paying money under the table, so oh, that yeah, they, oh, yeah. they they they, oh, yeah. they don't even have to join the line anymore. Their paperwork. Exactly. So, so there it is. But, but all those little things, yeah. Yeah. All right. all right. Thanks so much and keep in touch. All right. 
Thanks for the support. Yes, and I need, I'm still waiting for you to support me on get on that lady. She didn't call me. I don't know if you gave her oh, my no, info. No, no, she but... gave me the information. She gave me the information. I have to get it to you. Um, uh, you see my number. You could text me the info. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me just get it going. Yeah, she did. She did respond. I'm sorry. My apologies. I'll you know, I'm just gonna have to. Uh, you know, you didn't come Friday night to to Andre, and no, you're messing up. So I know, you I know, know, you're I know. I've been a bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll talk soon. I'll send you. This All right, thank you. All right. Yeah. Same Oops, I cut her off. Um, uh, uh, two things I saw. Um, uh, one of them is the 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 UIC business. Look, I I. I'm trying to stay away from the politics thing and just deal with policies, as I said, politics, people, and performance. Because once you start getting involved with political parties and start, you know, you start taking sides, it, it, I think you're going to lose focus. Right now, my focus is all about service delivery uh, from the government to the people. And that's where, that's my, that's my safe zone. That's my sweet spot. That's where I'd like to, 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 to be. Um, let me just say something about the UIC. They, they have three things in their manifesto that I didn't get a satisfactory answer on any of, any of them from 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 uh, uh, Mr. Patterson. One is uh, actually it's more than that. One is they said that they would in the manifesto they said they would move to repeal laws concerning gambling. Um, they said they don't want to be involved. The government shouldn't be involved with gambling. People should just gamble freely, whatever they want to do. Second one, drugs. They said, hey, the government shouldn't be involved with people, you know, taking drugs. Um, and that's that. And the third thing is, he said, the government shouldn't be involved with prostitution, sex for uh, uh, for money. People, sh The government should not be involved in that. Should just let people do whatever they want to do because it's basically it's their body and whatever, you know. And 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 then you take those three things and you ju you juxtapose them with the fact, or you compare them to, to to put them up against the fact that Mr. Patterson was arrested for violating the Public Order Act. Right? He was he was he was um, protesting without a permit. And I had a I had a problem with that when he came on because I asked him. I said, "Why is it? It it, it would appear as if that." He knows how to uh, get rid of laws that 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 he doesn't like. And when I say he, I'm using it in the in the plural sense, meaning the organization. So he's saying, for example, we will we will repeal these laws: prostitution, drugs, and uh, gambling that we don't like. But he didn't seek to repeal the public order public order act. He willingly, intelligently, voluntarily, consciously violated it and he said he did it because he didn't believe that he should ask the government for a permit to protest against the government now i find that you know that's that to me if you're going to lead and you recognize that if you don't like a law you get people in parliament and you try to repeal it that's the system we have so you work within the system he went out and he did this. He violated the law. So I asked him, I said to him, well, look, since you feel so strongly about this, about not believing in, in, in compliance with a law that says that you have to get something from the government to do something against the government, why don't you do this? When your case is called, why don't you write the judge and say, look, I'm not coming because I don't believe in, in this system of justice. I don't believe that I should show up and face charges for violating uh, an act that... I don't believe should exist in the first place. So, you know, the, it, these are the things that I find just, first of all, they're inconsistent. And the idea that you're going to break the law uh, when you admit that you know that there's another way of going about repealing the law, getting rid of that law. I, I have a problem with that. And then it's not consistent because if he's if he's saying that He's, he's, he doesn't believe in, in, in that law and he doesn't believe in seeking a permit, then he shouldn't go to court. He should just tell the judge that you're part of the system and I don't believe in this. I don't believe that I should be here. I should be there, actually. He should write to the judge. I don't believe I should be there talking to you about a, a public order act because I don't believe that. I don't believe in the act. I don't believe I should get a permit to protest against the government and therefore I'm not coming to your courtroom. So I'll see you later on. Um, that's what I think he should do. So 
And <clears throat> excuse me. There are things about the UIC. There are some good things about the UIC. I don't want people to get me wrong. That the UIC is completely off base. There are some things that I do like about the, U uh, the UIC, but there are some things there that are gravely troubling for me. And so uh, my 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 position is I want to stay away from political parties. I just want to concentrate on having the governing political party take care of the people, do the service deliveries, live up to your mandate of accountability, transparency, ethics, good governance. Do that and we'll be fine. Herb. Hey, uh, somebody's asking about community policing. And um, in Jamaica, uh, what we tried to promote was community policing by officers getting involved within the communities that they serve. In other words, if you're in a community, you should know up and down the streets of your community, the people in that community. You should know where the kids are. You should know what the time the kids assemble. You should know how to get the kids involved in various programs if they don't have any programs to be involved in, like teaching them uh, basketball, uh, football, uh, cricket, uh, getting them the equipment, um, finding out who can sponsor uh, certain equipment uh, for the kids in your community, becoming a coach, right? Because one of the most respected people in any community is the coach, whether he coach the football team, he coach the basketball team, the swim team, whatever. That coach carries a lot of respect with it. So even though they might hate the uniform and hate the police, if you're doing a good job in that community, if you're working within your community, and I'm saying this uh, because of uh, first-hand practice, right? We work with a lot of kids in communities using soccer and the fact that they can see you and come up to you and say hey coach how you doing All right and make them their presence known to you in that community it is fantastic so i would say the 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 person who is in service to their community not patrolling the community right but in service to that community is always the one with the ear to the ground and will hear things before they actually happen. Or if something happens, you hear the whispers or somebody's going to whisper in your ear and they're going to give you the tips you need to resolve that problem. But, but you cannot come in and patrol a community and live 10 miles away and the only time you're in the community is when you come in to patrol and beat up people. Mm. You, you have to have community involvement and you have to love your job and love the people that you're working with. All right. Okay. All right. The, the, the foundations, people, people keep, keep um, asking. Um, it, it, um, we're still waiting on the IRS to come back with the status of uh, the tax exempt status. Once we get that, then we'll be in business. And someone just mentioned that they disagree with me on the protest because um, why do you need a protest? Why do you need a permit to protest against the government peacefully? Well, look, it's very simple. Uh, there are laws, and, and 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 we're talking about Jamaican laws now. And if you don't want to abide by them, that's fine. But then, you know, you suffer the consequences. Uh, and 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 peaceful protest, you just can't get out there and do that because. You have something called public order, where you know you're going to interrupt traffic and pedestrians and all of this. And Mr. Patterson and I, we had a conversation about this, and I think he understood what I was trying to say, that it, it just won't work the way he, his approach just won't work. He's going to get abused by the police, right? So if that is what you want to do, then that's fine. You can go ahead. I'm just telling you that. It, there's a, there's another way of doing it. You can bring an action in court, or you can you can get your people in parliament and try to uh, uh, repeal the law. But I think by just going out there and say, well, you know what, we're going to violate this law, this public order, a specific law. Now we're talking, and you're going to go out there and violate it. Then 
you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. So why put yourself in that position when you have options? That's all I'm saying. I'm saying if you want to go ahead and you want to violate the law and you want to, then then be my guest. Go ahead and do do that. But uh, and then Roger, apparently you joined us late because we talked about a bunch of things that we're doing, not just things that 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 you know just talk 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 talk. Yeah, we identify the issues. Yeah, we discuss strategies. But there are things that we are specifically dealing with, and I trust that once we get, uh, you can talk to some of the members in the in the chat about the foundation um because i've spoken about it several times already and once we get it going i trust that you'll be one of the first to raise your hand and say i'm going to support this because it's not about talk now it's about action um yeah i think huh, man a couple of people said man I, I need to end this thing now because you know it's just going on and on and on and on we were hoping to end it at seven now it's at 7:23. so i think this is where we're going to take our leave yeah, let so, me just answer this one one person that say coaches rape kids and do different things. Yeah, you know, we are actively asking a lot of teams in uh, Kingston and St Andrew, um, Kesafa, or in some of the other uh, country um, parishes. If you are aware of coaches who are molesting kids on the teams. If you haven't turned them in by now, then you're part of the problem, right? And so what what we what we um, have, have done is is to to look at the the system, the reporting system. Nobody wants to to get hurt or hurt anybody with the reporting system. Well, if if that's how you feel then these people are going to continue molesting kids out there. Another point I want to make is there are some football teams and other uh, sports, cricket and others, who feel that they must go out in the community and have three and four and five baby mothers. And as long as you accept that type of behavior, you are part of the problem. All right? And if the baby mothers are underage, then shame on you, right? If they're under 16, right? There are lots of 12 and 13 year olds giving delivering babies down at Jubilee Hospital, and there's no DNA testing being done to see who the father is, right? So you folks are gonna have to get your act together, and you're gonna have to decide that you're gonna turn these people in. So if you know of a coach, or coaches out there, especially if they are police officers or are from JDF, and they're creating mischief in the community rather than doing good things in the community, then turn them in by all means, all right? All right, let me just say that before we go that um, somebody was asking about, somebody said, oh, um, trusty, I think was saying that we're just, we just keep talking, talking. What I would suggest you do is, uh, because I think, I, if you joined us late, I can understand your position, but um, just go back and and go back and listen to the, the 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 broadcast in full, and you will see where we made some specific. We provided specific ideas about things that we you know things that we think will work, um, and then also if you have if you have uh, ideas, we'd love to hear from you because. We don't think that we're 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 just the brain trust that we come up with the ideas. This is a collaborative effort. Uh, so if you have an idea, put it in the chat and let's discuss it. Like there's a gentleman who called tonight, and he had a, he had an idea about splitting up Jamaica into three into the three the natural borders, three counties, and then doing some things trying to help each county, and that generated a spirited discussion. So that's what we'd like. We'd like if you have don't just come on and then just criticize. First of all, you probably need to come early, but if you can't come early because we understand that things are going on in your life, then listen to the program in full. And then if you disagree with what we're saying, then come back and say, hey, I disagree with you because of this, this, this. And then put forward your idea because we're not just sitting up here saying, well, this is how it should be done and this is how it's going to be done. And, and as people say, it's a government by the people, for the people, of the people. So join us and, and bring your bring bring your points to the, to the, to the table. Um, Another point I'd like to make is that I consistently and constantly uh, 
send messages to politicians to come on the program. And so far, it is what it is. Some of them have responded saying that it's not a convenient time. Some of them have not responded. And I continue to ask them uh, directly. I continue to ask them directly. But there's only so much I can do. They don't come on. Uh, the program is still going to go on. We still have to discuss the issues. I would love for them to come on. But for those of you thinking, why is it that I don't have more politicians on the program than what I've had before? It's simply because I've asked and they've not responded for whatever reason. Um, and some of them might very well be busy and they can't, they, 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 you know, they can't make it. But we'll have to just live with their decision. The, sec the, the, the second thing is a lady mentioned that she was very excited about the Kamina Johnson Smith lawsuit, but then things that you know things seem to just drop off. Well, uh, let me announce to you that things haven't dropped off. Uh, the lawyer, there is a lawsuit against a, a, a very significant politician in Jamaica, and the lawyer has the information and she's going through it right now. So I don't know when that's going to be ready to be to be. Uh, um, to be uh, uh, action to be taken on it. I don't know, but I do know that the information is there with her. And then also there is a second lawsuit that will be filed against Kamina Johnson Smith. And I think it's gonna be filed this coming week. There are some things that happened with mine and the responses. And that has basically triggered a second one to be filed. And the paperwork is almost finished. It's about 90, I would say it's about 90, 99% finished. So we should have that one in the hopper, as they say, uh, sometime next week. And uh, if you have ideas about things out there that we should be looking at, then please let us know. If you have information about corruption, then please let us know. Um, and as you heard earlier today, there is a statute, a US statute concerning kleptocracy, meaning government a thief money, that if you, um, if you provide that information and there's a prosecution, a successful prosecution, you get up to 30% of the seizures and the forfeitures. So, and I actually met with a, gen with a gentleman who's very familiar with this law this week as a result of uh, Herb's program, uh, Herb and the Institute's program. And he and I had a very lively discussion about that. I'm going to be in touch with him. And so we'll move on. So there are things we're doing, um, but you just have to be patient. Uh, it's not that it's a secret that we're not telling you what we're attempting to do. We have told you, but like, for example, the, 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 um, foundation, there's nothing we can do at this point. It's in the hands of the IRS. We just have to wait. So having said that, Herb, do you have any closing state now? Uh, uh, anything? Uh, I, I, I just love the audience. I think they keep coming at us saying they, they, they get a second win and they keep coming some more. Oh, we love, I appreciate the support and blessings to you all out there. Uh, and hope to see you all again uh, tomorrow night. And, um, yeah, yeah, tomorrow we have something called, um, for those of you who uh, will be free at 4 o'clock, uh, uh, 4 o'clock, that's 4 o'clock New York time, there's a program called Waterhouse Vibes, right? Waterhouse Vibes, tune into that. And then at 7 o'clock, um, uh, uh, New York time, uh, we will, I think we'll have the town hall meeting with Lonesome because I'm, yeah. I'm not sure though her because he's got a two day, he's got a two day, co um, concert going on. So I'm not sure if he'll have time to do it tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. But, um, we can tune in anyway and see if we're on, if we're on, we're on, if we're not, then it will be the following. Uh, the, week, tu so. the tune in is, is usually, um, YouTube. Yes. YouTube. All right. Yes. So everyone take care. Thank you for participating. Thank you for the support. And Thank please you. continue to do the same. Love Take care. All. Be well. Blessings. All right.